Ladies and gentlemen, speakers, audience, and we're still waiting for some people. Uh, apparently, a bus was delayed. The train was delayed, so apparently the bus is late as well, so we'll have some people joining us a little bit later. Um, it's wonderful to have you here in the room and online and uh, you have different contexts and connotations but you're all very much interested in questions of the relation of religion and communication in the cultural public especially when it comes to museums and exhibitions and this is what led you here and thank you for following our invitation and I'm looking forward to tomorrow's speeches and tonight's keynote and a, a warm welcome to our participants online on YouTube following the FR8 the future for religious heritage it's an a masterclass for Europe and uh, online, and we have it in German and in English with interpretation. So welcome to Le Courier, the conference house of the Martin Luther University Halle-Wittenberg. A warm welcome. And I can say that as a representative of the university, I teach at the Institute of Catholic Catholic theology since 2005. So, why are we meeting? Why are we gathering here and having this symposium? We had to have a pause because of the pandemic. So now, four years later, we have the next symposium because the last symposium was 2018, Neuzelle, close to Frankfurt order. I really remember this, and we also published an edition, a book with the Loris Verlag, and we have the table at the back where you find several publications from this conference series. Well, I mentioned the pandemic. Unfortunately, the pandemic has been present here in Wittenberg as well. Um, over 30 people from different academic, educational, and museum contacts had registered to come here in person, but unfortunately, several of them had to stay at home because they tested positive for COVID. And it's one of our speakers as well, Pastor Dinkelacker from Frankfurt. But uh, luckily, he has a mild case of the illness, and he said he will present online via Zoom tomorrow if he's still feeling well tomorrow. So we're meeting in Wittenberg. Well, it was planned for 2020, and then we moved it to 2022, and we wanted to celebrate it in another place. Kloster Linien in Brandenburg uh, had always been the main place where we met, but also Kloster Michelstein in the Harz was also um, an option. But then we had this discussion with you, Dr. Rhein, and we found new perspectives and the topic of language and religion or language and religions and languages and religions were very much put into this debate by you so thank you very much uh, the Martin Luther University and the Berlin Teltow Lenin House Stefan Bayer here on my left really we're happy to include this and now we're in Wittenberg Luther Wittenberg Luther New Testament Wittenberg Luther September Testament Wittenberg so it's a worthy occasion to have our symposium here and we have the religious and theological issue that we can explore in this question of translating the New Testament into German, into Saxon German. Well, unfortunately, we didn't translate it into Franconian, so I can't really speak that today. And we're in a good place because 
Wittenberg is important for communication and languages and religion. The so-called September Testament I just mentioned is a wonderful example and an occasion in 2022. Martin Luther had translated the Greek New Testament when he was interned in the Wartburg, and in September of 1522, he published it anonymously in Wittenberg with 3,000 copies. On September 21st, in 1522, it was brought into stores and into circulation. So we will go for dinner in the Kranachhöfe property, and this is the place where the printing house was and where this testament was printed. By Maufat, it really is an adventure, as you call it, the adventure of translatability. And what that means for the Quran today, we'll learn about that tomorrow. Well, finances are a sorry topic. We are all live in a world where services need to be paid. And that such a symposium, a scientific symposium, is even possible and financially viable is due to the budgetary cooperation of partners. So, in addition to my university, the Martin Luther University of Halle-Wittenberg and the Evangelical Deaconess House berlin telto lenin with Stefan Bayer present here, um, I would like to mention the following, the Luther Memorials in Saxony-Anhalt, Dr. Rhein, thank you very much, the RWTH Aachen University, and especially the Institute for Catholic Theology, namely um, Professor Blum and Professor Mayer, thank you very much for the financial support. And there's uh, quite a considerable amount, a financial contribution from the European Civic Organization, FRH, the Future for Religious Heritage, that made streaming possible. Just one short aside on tech. We take pictures, we take videos, and we're streaming. Thank you very much for um, agreeing to this. And on this streaming portal that you can find on YouTube, FRH, it's, it was announced as a European masterclass in German and in English. So all of you here in the room and in front of your screens, welcome to our conference exhibiting religion, exhibiting religious language, communicating the languages of Judaism, Christianity and Islam in the museum. And I'll briefly hand over to my colleagues, my colleague and partner Stefan Bayer, who's one of the main co-organizers of this series of conferences and has been since the beginning. Harald, thank you very much. I would just like to very briefly thank all of our um, tech staff and I would like to present them to you because we do need a lot of technology because we're not only on site but online as well. So first of all, Ms. Krieger, Ms. Kirsch, I'd like to name you, your staff members from Mr. Schwillos, and thank you to our translators, Ms. Brückner, Mr. Thomas, welcome. They are doing the English translation for us so that we can listen in English to all of the presentations. And I'd like to introduce you to the wonderful team, Cybrix Media, Mr. Hösel, Mr. Russia, and Mr. Reuter, who will be walking around here and um, accompanying us during these two days. And feel free to ask them questions should you have any. That's all from me. Let's get started. Okay, the introduction. 
We will have the introductory lecture after the welcome statements. We are very happy to have them here. We've reduced them down. A former rector of the university said, welcome statements are a special kind of persecution of Christians. And this is why we did not do this and reduced it to two welcome statements. And the first one I'd like to announce, and I'm personally very happy about it, is Sabine Verheyen. She is the chair of the Cultural Committee from the European Parliament. So please play her welcome statement. Ladies and gentlemen, I am delighted to send my warmest regards from Brussels to Lutherstadt Wittenberg. If the two of you are exploring the themes of religion and language is something very special because languages and communication connect us and religion does the same thing and both are vital to uh, the diversity of Europe and these two cultural aspects need to be interlinked because language and religion can achieve so much and they create communities and values. So in the beginning there was the word that's what it says at the beginning of the Gospel of John. And this is a wonderful quote because words have meaning, a context, a background, an opinion. A word is a concept or transmits a concept that was characterized by religion as well. And the relationship of language and religion is very complex. The connections from language to religion and from religion to language is very important. And people were influenced this, by this hundreds of years ago already. And let me name the famous example of the confusion of tongues in old Babylon. They wanted to build a tower that would reach into the heaven. And because of this arrogance, God reacted with the destruction of languages or the splitting of languages. And one unique language became many, many languages, and they couldn't communicate anymore and build this tower. And nowadays, we have many narratives and a lot of research into this story. So language is an important building brick of religion because communication creates communities and you can celebrate faith together. And language can also contribute to understanding your own religion better. For example, by translating the Holy Scriptures into our languages. And you can still feel the impact and the effects of this in Wittenberg. You've got the Kranachhof property where Luther's testament was printed, and it's a place that contributed to understanding and communication. And in Islam, Arabic is an integral part of the religion. It's an umbrella language of many different dialects and was purposely chosen for the Quran. And Arabic is not only a language of communication, but also a symbol for the religion itself. And an interesting development can be seen in Judaism as well. They had Hebrew and Aramaic. And when the Jews traveled into different language regions in the world, mixed languages were created from Hebrew and the country's language. For example, Ladina, with, which is Spanish and Hebrew, and then Yiddish, which is German and Hebrew. And all of these Abrahamic religions have different access points to language, but in all of them, language contributes to cultures and to exchange. And the protection, conservation of cultures and language is part of the European Charter and is fundamental for our community of values. Thank you for choosing this wonderful theme, and I'm really happy to send my warmest regards from Brussels and have a wonderful conference, interesting presentations, and good and fruitful discussions about languages and religion. Thank you very much, Ms. Verheyen. 
And we have a second welcome statement before I will take over. We have Lillian Grotzwagas. She is the president from the FRH, the Future for Religious Heritage. Welcome to the FRH Masterclass. While reading the, the, the announcement, exhibiting religious language, communicating the languages of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam in museums, I got very much interested and inspired. Religion has its own perspective on the world and reality, which cannot be substituted by anything else as a German philosopher, Jürgen Habermas, amongst others, has pointed out. Religion expresses itself through specific ways of speech form, but religious objects and articles of daily use are often exhibited in museums. But the language forms and communication connected with them are not in the focus of didactic mediation. This symposium uses this as a starting point and highlights the languages of religions. As president of the average and of the average advisory board of the Network of Future for Religious Heritage, I am very proud to be one of the founding members and to see how average grows, and more and more specialists are joining to enforce the knowledge and the strengths of the network. The challenges facing European religious heritage are huge and growing every day. Therefore, more exchange of knowledge and experiences are necessary. This masterclass gives the possibility to show and share and transfer the knowledge of this topic available amongst experts in Germany to all European countries. So we as FRH are very pleased that we have the opportunity to organize masterclasses in itself, as they create the possibility to go in depth, really in depth with experts on a topic. For these two days conference, Mr. Bayer and Mr. Schwiles have taken a very interesting topic, not only in the field of museum, not only in the field of experts, but also a necessity to learn how to transfer, communicate in ways that will help and support the understanding of religious heritage of multiple religions in general. Nobody understands today the religious language, how it is possible about the meaning of objects and today's topic brings us a lot of new information. On behalf of Average and its president, I want to say special thanks to the University of Wittenberg for providing the location and Mr. Stefan Bayer, well-respected member of the Average Council, and Professor Harald Schwiles, who invited all the speakers and are responsible for the program. Religiöse Sprache ausstellen. Exhibited words, language, the language of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam in a museum and to communicate it. I wish you a great and interesting exchange of thoughts and a lot of fun. Thank you very much. I would like to thank you also, Ms. Gordes Fun is something you might be having. So, I would like to the text at first, which is already 40 years old, it's an old song. Theo, we are going to lodge, it's the title of that song. Well, what do these words mean? They are talking about a person, a very specific person. And it's not Herbert, it's not Franz, not Willy, no, it's Theo. But who is this Theo? Isn't it also the Theo in all of us? The Theo who appears in such wonderful words as theology, theodorant, tea or coffee. And a message is addressed to this mysterious Theo. Theo, we are going to lodge. We are going. So four people are going. And who are these four persons? Are they the four seasons, the four musketeers, or is it all of us. Well, jokes aside, this is certainly, and it is, is meant to be, a humorous caricature of Christian ecclesiastical preaching language, 
by a well-known German comedian, you know him, it's Otto Walkers. Oh, I took it from a book, or Pedersen and Kesslersen, phrases of our blood-empty language of the church. But there's also a trap here, a cliché trap into which the communication of religious language must not fall. And this applies, mutatis mutandis, not only to the religious language of Christianity, but also to that of all other religions. At our conference, preferably that of Judaism, Christianity and Islam. I would like to look at the whole topic with a heuristic intention in order to provisionally mark out the field of museum and religious languages formulated in three attempts. First, an attempt at transmission. Here we must first consider the problem that, on the one hand, the languages handed down in living liturgies, and beyond that, the forms of languages associated with objects and themes are in need of explanation in the first place. And this is especially true in a museum connotation. This applies both to people who must be connoted as religious, and religious, but equally to people who are involved in the current practice of their religion. They all find religiously connoted artifacts in the museum, which in turn also require explanation for today's believers and also professionals. One, two examples. The kissing tablets that were used in the Christian liturgy of the monasteries and convents in connection with the greeting of peace, so as not to kiss each, having to kiss each other, so this tablet was used, this table that you would kiss, Today you would say it's a corona-related measure, but in those days it was the intention was different. Or a tradition I know from my childhood, from my grandparents, that in the month of May, I am Catholic, that you had a May altar at home. Nobody of my students from today knows this. And such nice things at religious water, less water at the doors, but a blessed water kettle, you find it on very special places, pilgrimage places. They were used, I, I know it from a childhood, but during some renovation, it somehow disappeared. This means something is happening that produces a great speechlessness in relation to these formerly very well-known languages. Because this kettle, for example, was used to give the blessing in the name of the Father, the Son of the Holy Christ. So these things have disappeared and are becoming less and less. And this means that the transmission of Christian-related languages, which also applies to languages of Judaism and Islam, is in good society, in good company. The cultural and also religious memory is characterized by a throw away and this religion connection and the connotation of religion might make this more clear. For example, there's an estimate of the of Gerd von der Osten, uh, art historian of Cologne, that the late Gothic wing altars in Germany, there's their only attention, 2% are left over, remain of these. And this even though in some regions, for example, in Franconia, Franconia, there is such an altar in every second church. But since 1525, in those regions, in after 1525, there are only very few examples. Another example, from the more than 50,000 created antique statues of gods from the Romans and Greeks out of seven centuries, only 24 are left nowadays. From the table paintings of the 15th and 14th century, 99% have disappeared. The essence, due to the decimated number of reference objects, the communication of religious forms of expression and language associated with them is severely limited in the museum and is only able to communicate and open up a fraction of what has been. 
large parts of the so-called folk piety as well, as magical highly religious mixed practices are often only found in ethnographic or folkloristic museums. Both would have to be more clearly linked and related to each other in order to produce at least an idea in the museum of how past religious language works and what it could possibly still communicate or mean to people today. And this applies to all religions and the objects and themes associated with them in museum contexts. Second, a musealization approach. Let us begin with a warning from a museological perspective with regard to the word in the museum, initially only related to the exhibition text, and nevertheless an important call for order for museum communication in the religiously plural society. Quote, the exhibition text must, even a text presented as an object, not, and I think about the Islam, where the letters and the writings are very much in, very important. I'm, in my mind, I'm going through the Berlin Museums for the Islamic units, where I see all these writings and I stand in front of it like an, an alphabet. Well, nevertheless, the visitor should not be oppressed, but should be stimulated. Texts are possibilities to let individual facets of a large cultural context flash up in which the objects were located once. Texts and the museum invite the visitor to use his or her imagination and fantasy. Nevertheless, we must not disregard the fact that the text must also provide the visitor with guidance. End of quote. However, what we are pr primarily concerned with here today and tomorrow is not these texts that explain and classify the objects and themes in the museum, but the way in which the religious objects, and this also means objects, realizations of religion, religion in a linguistic form, can be communicated in the museum in an adequate and responsibly connoted manner. All this is to be considered against the background of the process of musealization. Ultimately, it is about a specifically human way of dealing, of relating to reality, which serves to build up a cultural, a factual memory. FIH is doing that at the moment. According to this, museumization is to be understood as a museum's engagement with reality. If the concept and understanding of this process derive from the term museum or museum-like, it is because in the course of history, museum institutions have always emerged as a means of realizing a specific relationship to reality. In order to be able to name this relationship, Stransky introduced the term museality into museology. Although museality is bound to a carrier, i.e. the thing or the object, and in relation to religion to certain forms of language, it cannot be described as its property characteristic. It only arises in the course or emerges in the course of the museum process of cognition. It is therefore the expression of a subject-object relationship, a relationship between men and thing. To musealize means then to decipher meanings and to integrate them into our world. The object, also the acoustic volatile, is never only a part of the past, but always also part of its own presence. In the process of understanding, we become part of past meanings. The object loses its original context through its musealization, but at the same time it is transposed into new ones. And it is precisely this process that we are concerned with at this conference in relation to religious language and religious forms of language of the three religions. For this reason, I am looking forward to tomorrow's afternoon's presentations and speeches. We have limited our selection to examples of museum communication that are within the framework of Christian tradition. There are several reasons for this. On the one hand, the series exhibiting religion has already explicitly dealt with museums and the communication of religion several times in the past symposia, which also took Judaism and Islam into consideration. 
since the number of such museums is still relatively small, duplication should be avoided as far as possible. In addition, the idea was to present the Christian museums in their diversity as it were pars pro toto. Protest Protestant and Catholic confessional museums should be included as well as state museums and the focus should not only be on museums that focus on religion in the sense of a reflection and presentation of explicit religious practice, but also on the aspect of religion and art. For the next symposium exhibiting religion in 2024, which is already in the initial planning stage with the theme of the museum staging of religion, another interreligious expansion is already being considered. Specifically, there will be crosses and martyrdoms, a religious speech in confrontation with depictions by Ms. Professor Daniela Bloom. Then we have an exhibition at the Bibelhaus Erlebnis Museum, Frankfurt, about the gender diversity since biblical times, and, excuse me, artistic approaches to the language of religion. Reverend will be Hannes Langbein of the Society for Contemporary Art and Church Atheon and language event Luther. I'm very excited how this will be connected. Third, a language problem. Bringing the traditional text into dialogue, into sound, with the museum's assets. Helga Kaiser recently formulated this in a very personal perspective, referring to the necessity of bringing the religion-related objects under consideration into communication with traditional religious texts, in this case, biblical texts, in order to actually bring religious depth layers of religious language and its reference objects into communication, into vibration with each other. She writes, a museum space sends the mind on a journey and stimulates the imagination. Involuntarily, I add to the world around an object. At the market gate of Miletus in the Pergamon Museum in Berlin, I hear the babble of voices of people dressed in antiquity. One room further on, my inner eye sees a Babylonian group of people in a ritual sinking a wedge-shaped cylinder into the foundations of a new temple building. On the processional street of Babylon, I can imagine Babylonian cult personnel. In the nation, the Assyrian king Sanherib stands in front of his nine view reliefs in the British Museum on which he had the capture of Lashish depictors. So it's about touching, being touched by dramatic scenes of the world history, human history, in which the biblical writings are inscribed, because I can read reflections of the historical constellations in biblical writings. Here we're talking about the language of the Jewish and Christian Bible, a reference text of the Quran, and of this also already in translation, and primarily from a historical theological perspective, provide in terms of content, but not from the perspective perspective of the linguistic constitution of the biblical Hebrew texts themselves. Religious language itself is thus, thus not directly in view, but what is religious language actually, and what was it, and what is it today? It is not insignificant significant to, consider, to, consider, to consider this if the language of religions is indeed not to be lost as an educational asset in a museum like connotation and, and subsumed under other language games such as that of politics, sociology, history, philosophy, and thus lose its actuality, the actuality of its own access to the world. But what's, what does that mean for communication of religious languages in general and in the museum in particular? Here I'm particularly looking forward to tomorrow's morning lectures which will make religious languages an explicit topic. So there were no other requirements. I already know one of the speeches, or presentation, because tomorrow we have Sabbath and the colleague Hamad Nahama could not come, but he will give us a Zoom presentation, and it's called The Spoken Word Applies. Language, um, talking about religion on the diversity and origin of the linguistic mode of socialization, and Islam and adventure and the adventure of translatability, 
which gives us a completely different view on, langu on religious language. So then we talk about the linguistic mode of symbolization in Christianity, and then it's not only a topic of theologians, but also of ethics researchers, scholars, and Nitolga is going to talk about it. Thank you very much that you will be here, that you're here, that you've come, that you made it. And she's talking about the philosophical, didactical approaches to this topic. So, the closing words, finally, once again from phrase, from our phrase, page 158, as an encouraging look at tonight and tomorrow, the glossary of this book lists a number of terms used in church communication and critically examines them, but also suggests how they can be understood more clearly, distinctly and meaningfully. Under the keyword challenges, there is the following entry which I think can easily be applied to our symposium and the work in the museum. All Christians face these challenges every second of every day. Challenges to master life, if possible in a virtuous way, in the sense of the Ten Commandments. A challenge, however, can also mean something practical in a general sense. Digitalization, good politics in the face of tyrannical aggression, Actually, the word means nothing but there is work to be done. I am very much looking forward to this work that is coming our way, as I get to shoulder it together with all of you now. And to start with, I am now looking forward to the first lecture of the symposium, the keynote. Dear colleague Stephanie Dio Rosenberg, I might introduce you. You studied Catholic theology at the university. Yeah, I studied as well in Würzburg, and you made a degree there, and I really love your CV, especially your scientific CV from 1983 until 87. You had a research stay in Upper Congo, uh, which was funded by uh, Aachen, an organization in Aachen, in, from 87 until 92, a promotion study in pastoral theology in Würzburg. And the promotion was done in 1992, and you were scientific in Erlang Nürnberg, and your habilitation was again in pastoral theology in 2001. I would like to tell the title because I think it's very exciting. I put my foot into the air, and she, the air carried it. How to deal with the strange old thing? people abroad and at home, and you were also a scientific assistant at the University of Mainz, and since 2005-2006, the winter semester, which unfortunately ended now, you worked as the Institute of Catholic uh, Theology, antidactic, but I will not let you go, I have invited you to this symposium today, and pensioners have a lot of time, don't they? So, today, she will give a presentation which is called Searching for the Appropriate Word, Religious Speechlessness and Today's Attempt to Language. Well, thank you very much for the invitation and I'm really happy that I can share some of my thoughts with all of you. In view of the time, I will try to keep it brief and stick to my script, because otherwise you might get out of control. So, looking for the right word religious speechlessness and new language experiments today. Words and things are very much connected. The same body heat for things and words. And these experiences of finding the right word and the distance between an experience and its linguistic expression should be kept as brief as possible. 
And, but this is a, can only ever be partially successful when an object and a word have the same body heat as Hilde Domin put it. Modern poetry is characterized by this speechlessness and f verses are drawn from silence. Speaking of Herbert writes a poem called Die Klappe, the shut. And there are people who grow gardens in their head and the hairs are path towards the sun. They write easily. They just close their eyes and just like that an avalanche of images streams down and my imagination is a piece of wood. All I have is a short piece of wood and I'm knocking on the piece of wood and it replies yes, no, no. Others see the green bell of a tree or a blue bell of the water. And my garden is much more sparse. I have only dry poetry available to me saying yes, yes, no, no. So, what happens when hands drop off these poems and I drink dry water in other mountains. It shouldn't matter, but it does. So what happens to poems when br the breath leaves them and the voice leaves them? When I leave the table and go downstream down the valley where we have new laughter under the dark forest, this is the effort of expressing what <coughs> really is. <coughs> the appropriate word can be understood from two perspectives. One is the person who says it, and the other one is the person who hears it. So who, the one who's speaking wants to communicate an experience they've made in a way that they themselves understand what kind of experience that was and that this experience was of significance to them. And in a second step, it is about sharing this experience in a way or communicating it in a way that somebody else can experience it as well or can understand this experience. And if you manage to do this, then you are hit and you feel these words, hit by these words and feel them. So is it, it is an experience that can sometimes not be expressed by the words that we use for them. And I was asked about language. And I'd say this is the point where it starts. We have something strange, something surprising happened to me and I'm trying to express <coughs> it. And this makes my language become metaphorical. I use paradoxes, comparisons, similes, ellipses, <coughs> metaphors, nonverbal gestures. Everyone goes through this experience, no matter if they see themselves as religious or not. And on the one hand, we have instrumental language. Johannes Andrek described this, the difference between instrumental and medial language. Instrumental language is the kind of language that transmits routine and is used by researchers and scientists and employed by them. And medial language is unfinished and it is looking, searching for a purpose and meaning. And searching for meaning is done by lyricists and it's done on purpose, which is different to us in our everyday life. And we also employ media language when we want to express 
something we cannot express. Like, I think it's somehow strange. Somehow, somehow, hmm, that's where it stops. The tension, well, in this difference between what I'm saying and what I'm referring to, the tension is upheld, even in the case of lyricists. They create these voids or this vacuum in order to make the reality that is behind these words more experienceable. And not everyone who goes through something that shakes them can then express it and qualify this experience as religious. But when we talk about religious language, this is what it's all about. This is where religious language happens. In the same language patterns, images, metaphors, paradoxes, and behind them is the same incomprehensible reality, because then that is the starting point of anybody who believes, I cannot comprehend this. So the difference between someone who says, I'm not religious, and someone who says, I am religious, is that the letter says, this is where God is at work. And the word of God already poses the threat of covering the mysterious. We know that in Judaism, the name of God is not said out loud. And that's this kind of sensitive approach. As soon as I say the word, reality is covered. But in Islam, you have 99 names, or even many, many more. And what's important is the last name, and that that one stays unknown, remains unknown. So I, we have religious speechlessness and language loss as well. So it is a, a question of quality when you're speechless in a religious way. And the prohibition of images is present in all three Abrahamic religions and it takes account to, of this experience but we cannot stay without communication about what touches us and deeply moves us. We want to communicate and then you need to find the right and appropriate and moving word for an unfinished and dynamic process, and it's very much about honesty as well. And Hilde Du means, she said, well, she described the task of a lyricist in such a way that I think it holds true to everyone who is active in religious proclamation. I quote, having courage means going against the fashion. Don't be like everyone else. Be not usable, be vivid and alive, and call upon everyone else to stay alive. You're a voice that can be hurt and is vulnerable, and you take sides where neutrality would be inhumane. So lyricism is about doing things nonetheless. And what's really interesting is you learn how to be afraid. It's necessary fear. And how to free yourself from that fear and anxiety. And in the history of Christianity, we have poetry, but we also have this ecclesialization of religious language, these empty phrases, they were already mentioned. We have affirmative language patterns. It's just said, well, it's like that or that. There are no, there's no vacuum. And this affirmative language wants to exert control. It loses this character of questioning and becomes apodictic and totalitarian. 
Hans-Dieter Bastian wrote about the theology of the question, and he reflected upon this quite some time ago, and it is the language of administering, and there's no authentic experience anymore, and they see real experiences as a threat, and they administer religious heritage, and they overlook the medial quality, the ambivalency, and the transient. And the listeners are questioned in their own existence. And then biblical texts from the Quran, from the Tanakh, they are texts where the experience of history has conjoined with the incomprehensible. And when you understand this literally and sacralize it and put it on a pedestal like this magic object, that's when it gets dangerous. So the prohibition of Im images is violated because every word is an expression of us humans. It's often just a bridge or a crutch even for the incomprehensible. It shows the truth and shrouds it at the same time. So the language of proclamation can become empty phrases, become monotonous, authoritarian, and violent. Authoritarian and violent, this happens when religion instrumentalizes language for um, for its own, for remaining in power, and it's a lack of secularization, and when it comes about your own opinions and making them omnipotent and legitimizing them, and I would just like to mention one example which is really shocking. In the film Gelobt sei Gott, about sexual abuse, The survivors are told after a conversation with the victimizer that they should pray. The mediators to tell them. And they say, and then everything is fine. So this is instrumentalization of religious language. Well, if the people of power within a religious community do not manage to bear the uncertainty of everyday life and to see it as a religious experience, they also um, stop everyone else from having this experience. People are not empowered thus to trust their own experience or to recognize it as religious and especially the people of today, it's less a crisis of faith, but rather the necessity to recognize religious experiences as religious and put it into words. There can even be a loss of language, and in a negative sense, this is produced by the religious institutions and, and because uncertainty is seen as a threat and not as an opportunity, and they return to authoritarian forms of expression of religion in their own tradition, in the Catholic Church, clerical forms of expression that granted a special status to a few selected, and the majority of believers were left in, were infantilized and were like sheep following their, their leader. And there's no questioning these structures. Religion and its ex express expression are often consumed as folklore. And it is not seen that it always wants to be different than the one before. But if we have unfinished language, 
then we have space for things that cannot be said and we can learn from poetry and art. They have joy and grief and pain and they take it seriously and this is how they enable others to recognize their own experiences and to discover new things in these processes of transience. So for all three religions, Judaism, Christianity and Islam, the following holds true. Man is the image of God, has a religious competency and this is what Karl Rana said, he's a place of revelation of the divine and this is why language needs to be democratic and the leaders of a religious community don't only have to share their beliefs and express their own questions, uncertainties, their hopes, but also those they care for should be elevated from this condition of speechlessness. So the evangelization which we use in Catholic theology is then a process of a, a mutual process. Lyricism and visual arts can help us to tear down old and strict perspectives. And visual arts are also a form of language that does not cover what humans do. So what applies is the same as for poetry, especially when it does not explicitly understand itself as, as being religious, it is meaningful for all those who are in interaction with it and motivate others to think about their own existence. The question is whether explicit religious objects, for example scriptures, the Bible, the Quran, or cultural objects that can be exhibited, and what would be the goal of such an exhibition? Is it about saving a cultural heritage, or is it about that it can be seen by the audience or visitors to put it into relation with their own lives? Can museums be altern offer alternative religious communication? What is the meaning, the sense of a museum? Is it about exhibiting everyday life or interrupting everyday life? We find everyday life objects, we find strange things, we find familiar things and extravagant things. Can religious language be exhibited? Well, first of all, the museum is a place that provides opportunities. It is open to everybody, no matter whether they are consider themselves as being religious or not. And it offers nonverbal and verbal motivation to see and examine the own thing and others. Contemporary artists ask the question of human existence, even especially if it's not only limited to explicitly religious objects. That's what we see in the museums. But is this already religious language, language that is exhibited? Other, they distort the religious objects and transfer them to find their own location, they find their own place in the world by uh, being the topic that a religion is, that religion is not in the common world. So, if we visit a mass and the difference between visiting a mass or the museum, that you do not usually go into a museum to have a religious experience. But what is possible is that the art exhibited in a museum touches you so much that you have an, a religious ex, uh, experience. But you can just go there to to consume art. You go there because everybody else does. If you go to an exhibition with explicitly religious objects, there are many possibilities why. Maybe you're a theologian, maybe you are a culture, a person interested in culture and religion, so it's just intellectual training. The control of the reception of a piece of art is not 
in the realm of those who are organizing such exhibitions and who are producing the art, it is left to the open-mindedness of the visitors. But how an uh, exhibition is presented does have an effect, because behind it is the motivation of the those people who are planning the exhibition. Do they only want to inform, or do they want to move the visitors? Are they involved by interactive elements? What are the qualities of these elements? Do they leave certain freedoms, or are they manipulative? If the goal is to move and to touch others, the orientation at the uh, in relation to the aspects named above would be helpful to install the objects in a way that they can speak for themselves and not to dissolve the tension that exists. The tradition would not only be conserved, but would also put into dialogue with modern times. Also, the museum, the same as the church, has a problem that is a place of well-educated middle classes. There are alternative alternatives, though. Action artists go to the streets and take the museum out to the streets and involve people into their piece of art. The conclusion of my explanation today, when searching into the ser in the search of the, for the appropriate word for the actually unspeakable, the religious communities could reflect on their actions in annunciation and liturgy and learn from contemporary poetry and art, in word, gesture, music, and material expression, not in a decorative, but in an existential sense. They have to accept the question to what extent they respect the religious competence of the individual. From this point of view, the value of the religious heritage does not reside in its preservation, but in enabling the individual to immerse oneself in its wealth of meaning and to find one's own language for one's own life's experiences. Thank you for your attention. I thank you very much, too. And I said it's usual for all those who have visited us before, they know it. There's no discussion now because we will have a nice dinner and it's a great opportunity to discuss things. I will just use one sentence from your presentation to install objects in the museum that they can, so that they can speak for themselves and do not dissolve the tension between the ambivalences and that tradition is not only conserved but is put into dialogue with modern times. That's exactly our task that we want to fulfill. It's we want to be educated. The museum is a place of education. So thank you very much again. And we don't want to leave you alone. I have a volume of our first meeting in two thousand and eight where the topic Guido Meyer was also one of the referees in those eyes, days exhibiting religion, interdisciplinary perspectives on, in the context of museum and exhibition of religious objects. So maybe you can use it for further presentations. Thank you very much for your great presentation. Thank you. Just two technical things, if you don't mind. Tomorrow at 8 o'clock we'll have breakfast for all those who are accommodated here. Well, 7.30 for all those having his hotel rooms. And it will be served in the cafeteria. You can find it very easily. We're going to have a little tour through the city organized by Dr. Gala because un unfortunately he cannot be here tonight. He has to be at another event. Maybe we can see him later at the dinner. Well, we have a little walk through Holy, the holy city of Wittenberg the Lutheran Rome, and I'm very excited. A colleague of you will do this, will do the guidance. I think it will last until 21 o'clock. Until that point, we will. there's a deadline until which we have to finish. And there's also the former library, where there is a fridge, and we have the key for the fridge. And 
where you can find water and wine, whatever you would like to have. I will show it to you later, so just ask me and be as honest to pay for it and do not um, charge the budget too much. So thanks for everybody who joined us on YouTube. Have a nice evening and I'm looking forward to see you again tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock, either here in person or on the streaming channels on YouTube at the Masterclass of FIH. Have a great evening. I'm looking forward to our dinner. Interessierte, liebes Fachpublikum, heute sind wir etwas mehr und wir werden noch etwas mehr werden. Äh, wie man sieht, die Anreisen sind As etwas äh, here, komplexer. Damit herzlich willkommen zum We ja, have some more people uh, and it's just been a bit tricky to get everyone here. So, welcome to the second day. Sorry for not wearing a tie. Today is a day of work and it's work I'm very much looking forward to. Yesterday, at dinner, I heard that yesterday was a very nice introduction, so thank you very much, Stephanie Lea Rosenberg, for giving us this input, and today we will take a closer look from a variety of perspectives, and this morning we will take the religious or the perspective of religions, and uh, we will also look from philosophy towards religion and the mission was it doesn't have to be a museal point of view you can speak about the languages of religion because this is kind of the the lens we want to use for um, a best practice example that we'll look at in the afternoon and I'm really looking forward to these presentations because the titles sound wonderful and promise a lot of variety. Uh, before I present Guido Meyer, I'd like to say that we first have our presentation by Guido Meyer on the perspective of Christianity, and then right after, we will hear from Rabbi Nahama, who pre-recorded his presentation, because today is Shabbat, and he would have loved to come here, but it's Shabbat, and the rabbi is, he is the rabbi of a synagogue and is busy today in Berlin. After that, we'll have a coffee break and then we'll continue in the same way. Our, our colleague Farmer Ulfat will speak about the Islamic perspective, and then we will have the uh, point of view from philo philosophy education. And after, our plan is to have a discussion of about half an hour for all of our speakers. Mr. Nahama cannot um, be here, so I will be taking up his chair as the host and to have this discussion between colleagues. And after, we will open it to the audience so you can ask questions and then we'll have our lunch break. So I'm really happy to have all of you here. And now it is my job to introduce Guido Meyer to you. We are co-publishers, co-editors of this series, Religion in Context, and this conference will be published there as well. There will be a, a book. And I'm really happy that we're meeting at this conference. And we just met at a conference and thought, okay, let's do this together. Guido is a, one of our bilingual colleagues. He is from Belgium. He lives in Eutin. But he teaches at a German university in Aachen. And for us, as religious educators, he is very, very important because of him speaking French and German. He is part <laughs> of both worlds. A lot of German translation. He's doing a lot of work there, so language is an important point. Uh, Guido, uh, you've studied Sciences Religieuses in Leuven in Belgium. I hope I pronounced it correctly. And it sounds wonderful. 
Sciences religieuse. And we say Diplom Theologie in German. It sounds much more uh, sober. It just, the French word just sounds like a good lunch. A lot of people here in the room are really at the grassroots, and you were at the um, pedagogy school in Belgium, and then you went to RWTH Aachen University. And I don't want to mention all of the associations you're a member of in French-speaking and German-speaking context, but I would like to point out that there's one publication very fitting for our context from 2018 with Norbert Wichert, your co-editors, The Languages of Church, about diversity and communication in church language. Guido, I'm very much looking forward to your contribution. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much, and I am very pleased about your introduction. So, again, welcome, everybody. The PowerPoint is working. So, I would like to share my thoughts with you regarding the diversity and originality of the linguistic symbolization mode in Christianity, which sounds a bit complicated, but I don't think it is at the end of the day. I just wanted to put it into words at this point. Before we start, a few remarks. At the beginning, I was not feeling quite well. Language, religion, and museum, to put it all into a presentation of 25 minutes, was quite challenging for me. And yesterday, this challenge became not so severe when I listened to the colleague and her presentation, so it fits perfectly, so like a mosaic, it might all come together today in these days. Well then, that's all the remarks. I don't want to say much about my person, and I, would, I want to talk about language, not my own language, but language as such. Due to my origins, I am from a bilingual uh, region, and I made the experience, something we discussed already last night, that language is more than just a means of communication. Language is a piece, is somehow a, a part of culture, or a large part of it is culture, and language is simply a part of being human. And this does not only imply spoken language, it also implies language as a means of communication in a, in a broad sense. Ladies and gentlemen, my presentation is not that of a linguist. I'm not a linguist. I'm just a religious, uh, religious educator. But what I know from linguistics is that language can be seen from two basic perspectives. You can see language as diachronistic, when it is about the history of language, how language is developed and emerged and continue to do so. And we can look at language as a synchron synchronic. My presentation is about the synchronic mode of language, what is the role of language, and which effect, effects does it have on the individual. And in this presentation you will hear that there's something that resounds. For example, I have dealt intensively with post-structural philosophy, especially from France, and you will find this at the one or the other part where there are some references. But the German theology, and especially a colleague with whom I have published a few things, Karl-Heinz Rusdorfer, who published a great book regarding the Catholicism at his first lecture given in Freiburg. And he finds out that telesemiotic um, change 
And he, what he means is the theories of science is not understood yet by theology, whereas the thinking of theology is more metaphysical. And he says we definitely have to, uh, well, I'm speaking of a semiotic term, and we have to adapt religious education to this semiotic term. And I will also speak to about the language seen from the outside, from external point of view and from the inside. And at the end of the day, it's about the question how, where, and how we speak about religion and within religion. Well, as I told you, language is more than just a means of communication and understanding. I have a nice sentence here from Jacques Lacroix, who is a, an important person in France, a great theoretician of post-structuralism. He says, human is a par les trois. Translated, this means he is a speaking being. Par les trois, par les trois, a word created by him, which means speaking is part of being human language is ahead of us, humans dive into language. They have to, in this world, in this ocean of language, they have to live. And languages, that's something you know from other authors, it's a resounding body of, of the body, physical. So we speak with our entire body. Language is being, something we learn from Austin. But language is also the common practice. We dive together into something. And something I learned from post-structuralism, language is also the basic of the symbol. Lacan says it's the basic of, of the fundament of the symbolic order. Lacan differentiates between three orders. There's the order of the imaginary, then between men and women, means it is like this, that's the world of our pictures. Then there is the world of the symbols, something that is the world of the science, the, the semiotic world that we don't see very clearly, where we get involved in a talk. And then there's the real world, but the real world does not doesn't have anything to do with realism, it is that we cannot call the, what, the thing we cannot say and cannot speak about. Pretty soon we will see the language builds a bridge to the unspeakable without reaching it. Language is circumventing this unspeakable. But language not only circles around this, but it also focuses on certain center points. And these are determined by our belonging, our longings, our longing. And we circle around it without getting to grasp it. That's especially the discussion between Jacques Derrida and Lacan on one side on the other side. And it's a discourse and dispute. Lacan says, well, language is running, but it circles around some center points in one's life some focus points. If you look into psychoanalysis, people will tell you this is something that will happen again and again in your internal discourse. Your partner, it will all circle around these topics. This is an external view. And now we go to this strange um, concept Oh, we have to continue here. I forgot to. I'm sorry about this. I should have done this before. Well, we are now on this slide. Now we have this concept of maybe we should have discussed this in advance. Can we go back? Yes, that's where it is. So I'll just give you science now. Is that all right? Well, 
Great. Now the about the three symbolization motors and and a friend psychoanalytic said it's not only because of spoken language, but people live in three different he calls it symbolization modus moduses. Three basic forms of expression. And they are this is sensomotoric, picture pictorial and linguistic. A small example. You come back home late at night, you had a very frustrating experience in the city at the university, if you want to. And now you come home and you can just close the door behind you. This is something like the physical part. You can turn on the telly and watch some documentaries about animals and dive into these worlds, or you can speak with your partner. In three cases, you express what you just experienced, what moves you internally, but in three different ways. And these three different symbolization modi that I can express have the same core fundament, which is linguistic. Because at the end of the day, it is what gives meaning to language. Nevertheless, there are differences. The pictorial symbolization modus is affirmative, always. Each picture is as it is, whereas the linguistic symbolization modus is in its focus, in its being, is a bit of a or motivates to resistance. If I, for example, say now, all people have gray hair. You all would look around, yes, look at you, you would look around, no, it's not true. There are some people who do not have gray hair. They have brown hair, let's say, but... So the symbolization mode of language motivates of uh, resistance, and it's direct and the core of it is affirmative. This is very essential, especially in today's time, and I'm already on my way to the museum here, where we, where we have many museums and objects that are all transferred into virtual worlds. This all has to do with pictures, and I believe from this perspective, the symbolic symbolizing uh, modus also has to change in the museum. And the issue is that when dealing with the symbolization modus, it's not that it's one or the other, but the way how we deal with it. And today in our societies, we are very much influenced by pictures and images. And what happens under this influence of the picture and the language? So the question is not which modus, the question is about time. Time we use for one modus and the other modus. This is something I would like you to think about. Well, the linguistic symbolization modus is where we create a world and the world receives meaning. And that's what combines language with the symbolic. And now about religious language, you see, um, these are all just theses. Religious language, ladies and gentlemen, as I said before, creates a bridge to the unspeakable. And religious language, as we learned yesterday already, works with the existential dimension of being human. In my language, I think you called it meditative, medial, medial language, something I understood as thinking of meaning, something that has to do with the being as such, it has, is confronted with it. It's not punctual. We try to, to understand 
being human as an existential dimension. And religious language, more than other languages, has a collective dimension. And something I noticed very specially, that's why I give you this picture here, the great work by Neil McGregor, who's the director of the British Museum, living with deities, and he has presented many artifacts and where he found the uh, collective dimension of the religious and the object language. So if you want to go into this stone age and see religious objects, this is not only an object, it is. It is a part of being human in this time, in this period, as a collect something created collectively. There weren't individual artists at that time, but there were people um, who had the assignment by the community to create what we see now. Religious language creates we c something we cannot say everything and, or the whole thing. On the one hand, this is, might be a disadvantage, but it's also a great as advantage because if something remains, this remaining part means that we have to talk about it again and again and continue to do so. Can we have the next slide, please? In certain ways, we have talked about this at some time, past times. We have published a little book together with Norbert Wichler, who is a linguist and Germanist, and we looked at how is language articulated, and we set in the sphere of the church. And we found out it's there's a diversity of language. There's a liturgical language. There's a biblical language. There is, there is, there is, there is. There is a, even a legal language. And all these are language types that do not have much in common with each other. Not very much. And then the question, which one of them is dominating, and what do we do, or how do we see what for us is the language of the church? Then, as some journalists might say, it, well, the church is dying because of its language, is what a journalist from the Frankfurter Allgemeine Zeitung said. But which language is it exactly? In which context? Obviously, we see an unbelievable malaise in the ecclesiastical communication, and we need reforms here. But how and when? We have to understand what do we mean when we say this. I said it in an article with the concept of religion, which we use every in everyday life. So what do we mean when we speak about religion? Do we mean that religion? Do we mean, when we speak about religion, well, in Rhineland, do we mean spoke, speak about Christian religion? Or do we, if we speak about religion, do we think about the church? Well, at least we should find an understanding. I, I meant, you meant, and this is something we have to clarify. If we speak about the originality of Christian language, I would allow myself to just give you a few little topics, because to my view, the Christian language originally comes from Jesus himself. And this is something we should look at in detail. What kind of language is it? The language of Jesus is a language, and this fits very well with psychoanalytical knowledge, is the language of a third person. I just refer something. It's we learn language in the view of some someone else. So for example, if you have bilingual children, then identify 
the language with one parent. The mother speaks French and the father speaks German, and they, the children would never make a mistake here. So language doesn't fall from the sky. We learn it like this. No, we connect it with the name of another person. The language of Jesus is the language of a third person. It's a language, I'm trying to formulate it, of direct humanity. This is the fascinating point about it, and of the New Testament, of the narratives and symbols, and where it is about everything, the entire story. It is a language that people take for granted and take seriously. And I was speaking about the imaginary and this that this solves this imaginary hardnesses. What how, what do you have to do? That's not interested for me. I'm interested in you as a human. The language of Jesus is against any type of legalese ritualism in the name of what man does. And it's a language that is in the center for the longing of the human. So human comes and says, look at my misery. And Jesus says, I'm not going to heal you. Look. He says, what do you want? What do you want? In psychoanalytics, it is called Kivoi. What do you want? What moves you? Think about the points I was talking about before. And if we find out this, then we can initiate healing processes. What do you want? And this is, the result of this, is that this imaginary hardnesses are open and dissolved and a, a direct contact with the imaginary, a contact with the deep layers of humans is created. That's why in France a very renowned woman says, Françoise Doldo, she put it in words in French, she's a man, what is it, where he says, Jesus teaches the longing and leads us to the longing. He teaches that, take yourself seriously, what do you want? Are you sure that you know what you want? What do you want? And from this point, I lead you there. When I, after I have asked myself, I'm getting at a crossroads, and I cannot get out. I have to make my, my decision now, this or the other. That is what is meant with it. And this is, for me, the centerpiece of a Christian, if there's something like Christian language, it is that. Maybe we have forgotten this centerpiece in our complicated language nowadays, but this is where, according to my view, we could find an approach. I don't know about the time now at this. Well, perfect. So then we could look at what this means or could mean for the museum. I'm just going to give you a few perspectives and ideas for you. We already spoke about the new medial paradigm, museum and visualiza virtualization. First of all, and that is my idea, we have to be very careful in using it. I'm not, I have nothing against technolo modern technologies, but we have to look how we can combine one with the other. How much language, that's my basic question, how much language do we still need? How much la language do we still need? And this is a very simple question, but with huge consequences. How can I bring language together with objects of collective experience? If you look at the message of Neil McGregor, Living with the Deities, the book I, <laughs> I strongly recommend to all of you, then the question is how how can language 
be involved in such a way that this collective dimension of rel religion, which is connected with these experiences, how can this be expressed? This is a very essential question for me. How can objects of Christian culture become meaningful objects through the spectator? Of course, we're not getting back to the original meaning, but what we win is a piece of this, well, this meaning, this Christian meaning, this direct humanity that we spoke about before. How can we retain this? How can we enter this level of experience? Hartmut Rosa, if he would be here, how can we find resonance for this? Knowing, and this is a part of the resounding theory, and beyond it, that the core is something we will never meet, because the real core, if we hit it, then we kill the object. Something that cannot be done, but we would kill the object. It loses its charm. Yes. Um, information kill the object. or they lead to a deeper understanding. So we can say the information, this was done in 1743 and all that, is something doesn't say much. But if we put it on stage in the right way, then it says a lot, then it's in the 18th century, and it kills, but on the other hand, it gives us deeper knowledge. And it's a very small path that we walk. At the end of the day, it's expression of a desire, and the last post-structural thought here, every desire, every deeper longing, Gilles Leleu said it, the French, it's almost <laughs> a French exercise that we're doing today, an agencement, and agencement, what it means is a certain context in, a, in an institution. What we heard yesterday, the museum creates being an object, and the question is how in this new institution, in this unit, how does, which effects does it have? How does it work? The psychoanalytics say if a woman, also a man of course, gets out and buys clothes. She doesn't look into her heart only and what might be fitting and appropriate. No, she imagines the event where she's going to, who will be there and how she, what will be the effect she's going to have on this event. Well, that also counts for men, please. Which means the longing works in institution. I think about the how it will work Please reflect this in the context of a museum. I'm not only exhibiting objects, it, it is also put into an institution, agencement in French. And this is where we have need this experience, this collective experience. And this experience has to be articulated. Well, ladies and gentlemen, these few ideas have come to an end. Thank you very much for your almost of your, for your attention, and I hope we can talk about it later. Thank you very much. Yes, and sorry for this medial, whatever. Well, thank you very much for this um, summary also. Uh, I think it's very, we have some points we can take to the discussion afterwards. So now I would like to introduce our next speaker who will be uh, 
giving us a media presentation, Professor Dr. Andreas Nachama. Just a few words about him. He studied history and Judaism at Freie Universität Berlin and also did his PhD studies there. And I will just pick some elements from his biography. Since 1997, he was the on the board of the Jewish community in Berlin, the Central Council of Jewish, and the World Union for Progressive Judaism. From 2005 and 2013, he was a founding dean of the Head Institute about Communication and Holocaust in Berlin. And he is, has been since 2013, rabbi of a liberal independent church in or community, Jewish community in Berlin. And since 2015, he has been presiding rabbi of the House of One in Berlin this Jewish, Christian, Muslim community in the center of Berlin. And since 2019, he's been the president of the General Rabbi Conference. He's part of many different associations, and I'd like to mention some of his positions. He's scientific in the Scientific Advisory Council in the ECO, the Protestant Church, in Berlin, Brandenburg, Schleswig, Oberlausitz, and he's a member of the Curatorium of the Institute of Church and Judaism at Humboldt University. And I want to just pick out one of his uh, publications, which is a good fit into what he will talk about, which is when it comes to the Jewish service and languages there. And his publication is You Are My God, Du Bist Mein Gott, published with Mayun Gadei. You are the God I am looking for, reading Psalms in the Jewish and Christian Dialogue, published in 2012 in Gütesloh. So I think it's very interesting to look at language from an interreligious perspective. Thank you. We'll watch his presentation now. Well, good morning. I would like to say it very clearly. We are here on earth. And if we are in a synagogue, we are in an enclosed space, and we connect via our language into another dimension. And with our prayers, we try to reach God. So uh, it is difficult, surely, in every religion. And it's not only language. It is the spoken word the way in which this word is pronounced, spoken, in order to attempt to get from here to him. The Jewish services are typically held in Hebrew. And, for example, for reading of the scripture, there have been a, a guideline it has been around since the ninth century, Rabbi Asher, who is read, who, whose reading out should be heard, and whose hearing should understand. And he proposed a system of emphasis for the entire scripture, the Torah, the books of the prophets, and the other scriptures we have. And he has developed this system. And when you follow the system of emphasis, you might have a similar system to Gregorianism and this way of presenting and speaking is a first interpretation of the text because you put commas in a, sen in a text that doesn't even have vowels because, of course, certain words uh, you want to emphasize them in order to make sure what we are talking about, that everybody is clear about that. So uh, the services in Hebrew are not only words said in Hebrew, but they are an attempt of structurizing language, of 
reaching the hearts and the ears of the fellow worshippers with language, but it's also the attempt of reaching God with language. And Jewish tradition says that every child, as long as it's still in the womb, understands Hebrew, and through the shock of birth, it loses this knowledge and has to relearn the language. But those who do speak Hebrew still have this memory in the at the core of their heart and can understand Hebrew. So there are correct explanations and nice explanations. This is one of the nice explanations. But what is correct is that in the 19th century, there was a project in Judaism, and they tried to have services mainly in the national language, so German or English, and it didn't really work out. So until today, progressive services are still made up of 70, 75, 80 percent Hebrew quotes and texts. And these presentations of these texts and quotes are very skillful. So if someone who is asked to read a part of the Book of Prophets, uh, this person is then also trained or they, they know about the system of emphasis and they will try to present it in such a way and if somebody reads it like a fairy tale, for example, so does it differently. Um, native speakers like Israelis often do this. It sounds different and strange to a rabbi because you are so used to the Sheh Shabbat, the Hebrew that we use on Shabbat, and we are so used to having Hebrew sung to us. Then we have the other prayers, so the Psalms, for example. They could be presented with this system of emphasis, but many of these Psalms have been around since many, for many, many years, and there was a composer in the 16th century, Orsi, who composed music for these Psalms, and they put music to the words. Wandowski and Witzer, they had this system in the end of having cantors of their time sing folklore or folk music, traditional melodies to them, and then they added uh, composing elements to it. So uh, there was, for example, a um, back and forth between the prayer leader and the community, but maybe also a choir, and the prayer leader had a sort of back and forth with the song. Um, the synagogue where I lead prayer and lead services, we do have a choir or had a choir until the pandemic had hit, but the community is very active when it comes to singing, so there we have a lot of interaction between the prayer leader and the community. And the community is very much involved in prayers and follows the prayers very attentively. And I'm sure this always depends on where you are, and it depends on whether you have a prayer leader that manages to kind of take everybody along and guide everyone to sing the responses and to do it in such a way that would be beneficial to a structured service that we have. But next to Hebrew, of course, there are also German elements in service, uh, in progressive service. So we have psalms read 
between the community and the prayer leader or the rabbi, verse by verse, or we have a whole prayer said in German by the prayer leader or the rabbi. And from 19th century, we have some examples of choir pieces that have German text as well. And that many in the community still remember very well, especially the older ones, but it's kind of gone out of fashion, out of use. Um, and there are other things said in the national language, so the sermon or some directions, instructions, we're on page X, Y, Z, or we're going to read text, Yesaya, chapter so-and-so. So all of these things show that there is a, a gradual system of how things can be done and were developed in cooperation with the community. And in Jewish services, when we have reading service in the morning, on Monday, Thursday, and Shabbat, there are always people who, or people are asked to read from the scripture who first have some blessings and the ca there's cantillation also, or they will just say them. And then we will read from the scripture and, for example, I do it in a way we have the five books of Mosey and they are just split up uh, for the weeks of the year. So we can read the entire books in one year. And I will read a part in German and then cantillate in Hebrew. So uh, when you have this part of scripture of the Bible or the book, with the text that everyone, even those Liebe, liebes Auditorium, um das einmal so zu sagen, wir äh, das mit einem and I think it's from an antique philosopher, the gods have created time. They never spoke about being in a hurry. So we're very happy that we Oh, we have an echo here again, that we can start a bit earlier, because it gives us the opportunity in our program. Ms. Schöne has come already, she's the head of a museum in Telte, which is highly recommendable, a museum which is called Religio, and which deals with religions, and our colleague Weimar Ulfart will speak about an exhibition in this museum. It's this exhibition. He is part of me, Muslim Worlds in Germany, which cannot be seen anymore, but the time that was given to us as a present will be used that between 5 past 12 and later we use this time for discussion and we will be see some pictures by Mr. Schöne. I think it's a great introduction for today's afternoon. Now I would like to announce the presentation of my dear colleague Fadi Ulfa from the University of Tübingen, Islam and the Adventure of Translatability. As I said, I'm very excited about this thing because it's about getting access to religion via language and I think this is also a completely different approach. She's a professor of Islamic religious education at the Center of Islamic Theology at the Eberhard Karls University of Tübingen and she knows what she's doing because she studied becoming a teacher for primary level and with some additional qualifications that I'm not going to tell you about because there are many, but then the extension Islamic religious education at the University of Osnabrück, where she became a scientific assistant in the division of Islamic religion pedagogy. In 2016, she made a PhD, the self-realization of Islamic children, an empiric study about the God relations of Muslimic children as a reflexive 
annotation to didactics. And she, when she was a junior professor, she is now a real professor since 2020 at that institute. And I would, she's got many memberships. There's two I would like to highlight. She's a member of the International Academy of Practical Theology, so a very interesting field of cooperation. She's also at the Center for Gender and Diversity Research, and she's also a council at Religio at the Westphalic Museum, Westphalic Museum of Religion and Culture. Dear Feimer, I'm really looking forward for your presentation. Thank you. The stage is yours. Yes, thank you very much for this friendly words. I'm really happy to be here today and would like to thank you for this invitation and would like to welcome all of you very warmly. And yes, exactly, I'm going to speak about religious, the religious language of Islam. And my presentation is called Islam and the Adventure of Translatability. As I said, I'm going to give you a brief example of the museum's practice, how to deal with the religious language of Islam in an exhibition, but Ms. Schöne is going to tell you more about it later on. At the beginning, I would like to give you an overview of the how Islamic religion theory and education was created as a discipline, how it started, so you can put it into a context, what I'm going to tell you. Because it's actually quite new, all this. Islamic theology as a scientific discipline was created in Germany after the recommendations of the Scientific Council in 2010. That's when it was established. And it is taught at the moment at seven, or at seven universities um, institutes of Islamic studies were created. That's in Hamburg. Well, Hamburg is also so altogether there are eight institutes. You don't see it very well on these maps. On the right map, you see the various locations. That's in Hamburg. It is not um, supported by the Federal Ministry of Research. Nevertheless, it's also listed here. But the first one was in Germany, the Islamic Religious Education Pedagogy. It was established as the first Islamic subject at universities, was thanks to the presence of Muslimic children at the public schools in Germany. From this existence and the necessity to have create legal uh, frame conditions for these children in Germany. Then there was became the idea of the, the dynamics were created to establish Islamic education studies in Germany. And this was decisive for this establishing. But also, on the other hand, it's also a subject, Islamic religious pedagogy which is not in the classical canon of Islamic theological disciplines. It's a subject which it was created only in Germany and in Austria, according to Catholic and Protestant, Protestant pedag religious pedagogy. The subject Islamic religious education is was founded in the necessity to teach Islamic children, but another challenge is also to translate Muslimic context and contents into the Muslimic public in Germany and else. And research is, it is to translate it into concrete practice, for example, in youth groups, in museums, but also in public spaces, for example, in politics, councils, social, advisory, media, and to transfer it to these means. This <coughs> clarifies the responsibility of this subject for society in its own, not only by educating future open-minded teachers and responsible teachers, but also by the scientific 
scientifically founded um, dealing with these and the to have it in practice in society and research and to answer these challenges it translations were necessary in many cases and in many ways and these translations of this translation is not at all simple um, begriffe Concepts or terms in Islamic theology have two levels of meanings. One is lexical and one is specific. The specific level of meaning can have variations within one concept and one term. For example, if we look at the term illa, illa means in the discipline of the Islamic rule theory of norms, ratio legis. So it's a ratio of the law, or ratio, what legal people understand of it, is the basic main thought of a legal um, rule. That's exactly what we see in the meaning in the Islamic um, theory of rules. Then we have another discipline of Islamic theology, and that's the systematic theology, and there this term means reason or origin of an act, for example, or the main reason for the existence of the world or existence of the human. So there is another connotation of this term. Then we have another discipline, and that's Sufism, the mystic, and that's what means sickness of the heart. So, completely different connotations that this term has in theological use and usage also on the specific level. If the concept is also used in everyday language, but it is, it is, doesn't have the implications and it's not compatible well, with the theological implication. Each discipline has its own specific language or terminology, which sometimes is also used by people, by laymen and laywomen. So, Muslim theologists, theologians in Germany also are missing the uh, linguistic instruments and tools of Christianity who have these concepts since many centuries. In Islamic theory, a number of Arabic terms are used which can never be translated one by one into German language. They require a paraphrasation or a contextualization. But the problems start before that. Arabic language, which is used in the Quran, differs extremely from today's Arabic standard language. The language use has changed, the context is different, the discourse is more pluralized, and the terms are losing their historical meaning over time. So this challenge is something that we can see in the example of the relig uh, Islamic religious education, which has a threefold dilemma. Islamic teaching at public schools in Germany is done in a language which is not the language of the Islamic theology or the primary sources. Pupils and teachers do not have, don't speak Arabic as a native language. And furthermore, the theological terms are characterized or have been created in a context that does not exist anymore. This also refers to the interpretation of Islamic statements. And this dilemma I would like to explain you with a few examples. And I would like to discuss with you the concepts of halal and haram and alcohol. Yes, we spoke about it last night, I know. And I would like to speak with you about this. Muslims use the words halal and haram and relate them to things, quite often to food. It also occurs in the Duden, that's a standard. Um, well, halal, according to Islamic belief, is something that is permitted, whereas haram is something that is 
prohibited according to Islamic beliefs in the Islamic theory of rules, where the actions of the humans are standardized. The concept of halal does not refer to things, but to the act of humans. According to Wal Halak, the concept of haram describes prohibited actions which are not acceptable due to legal or other reasons, whereas halal describes actions that are permitted, but there is a great variety and a great span. There's not only black and white between halal and haram, but both terms are very common also in everyday language. They are used very often, even they are even um, listed in the Duden. So which means a, a food cannot be halal or haram. The food itself cannot be halal or haram. No, the action of consuming it is haram or halal. So we have in everyday language the categories are confused. There's a confusion about the categories. Halal, as a legal term, has nothing to do with the nature of the production of this product. Whereas on meat products, we see quite often 100% halal. This label leads to the fact that things are called halal or their nature or their production, which is a standardization and a clichéization of, of a linguistic clichéization. Well, now I'm talking about alcohol or the prohibition of alcohol. We all know that alcohol is not permitted in Islam, which is a... But is it, in fact? Is that the fact? Well, not only meat products are labeled with the term halal, but also other types of food with haram, which means prohibited. Well, alcohol is called haram, also in everyday language, not only in the theological language, but also but in everyday language. And we have also among Muslims, Muslims do not know that there's no clear consensus among the theologic Muslim theologians. There's only the consensus that it is prohibited to consume the wine of grapes. This is something that is, well, one could say maybe you cannot say it. It can be derived from Islam. Of course, this remains open for discussion because in Iran it says Hamr, that's grape wine, which is prohibited. Hamr has other lexical meanings I don't want to refer to right now, but as a standard it is used as a term for wine, as in Surah number 2, verse number 219, you see it here, which is in bold letters. It says, they ask for wine and for betting, which is both are very sinful and useful for humans. The sin, however, which lies in both, is larger than its use. The classic commentators and wise men say that the Quran has a level, a few levels of the prohibition of wine that can be derived from this. First of all, it's even seen as a sign of God, as we can see in the first verse here. Quote, and from the fruits of dates and the grapes you create intoxicating drinks and great food. And look, this is a sign for the humans who understand it. But the consequences, then we have Surah 2, number 2, as I said before, where it says that the damage but also the use of wine is contextualized. And the damage of wine is larger. And this was not seen as a prohibition at the beginning. Neither the first or the second Zuru were seen as a prohibition. As the time, as the contemporary people did not change their way of life. And so the 
prayers were disturbed, so people came to the prayers and were drunk. So a new prayer was opened, published, where it says, Oh, those who believe, don't get drunk to the prayer, so that you know what you want to say. But even this was not seen as a prohibition, as a general prohibition to drink wine, until they came the Suri 5 verse 90, which has made it quite clear, this prohibition, where it says, see, wine, betting, victim stones and arrows are the work of Satan. So avoid it, maybe then you will feel better. Feel good. So what you can see here, this is that we have certain levels um, of escalation, but don't get disturbed by the numbers of or don't get confused by the numbers of the Suris because we have 16, then we have 4, then 2, then 5, because the Quran is not in a chronological order. So, it's much more, the Quran is about the time when things were announced. And that's where we see the relation between these announcements. So all this has to be interpreted in one way or the other, which is not quite easy. And the interpreters had two different questions. Well, most of them were men, where we have this, where we know this from, and what was put down in writing. So two questions. First of all, what has to be called wine. And the next question is, if this also includes other alcoholic drinks, because the Quran speaks of wine, but what is wine? And is everything that contains alcohol also to be called wine and is therefore to be prohibited? This means is everything generally prohibited that leads to intoxication. And in the Islamic world, to drunkenness, and in this Islamic world, in the history of theology, we have very four very famous men, and they are the founders of legal schools. That's Malik ibn Anas, Ash Shafi, Ahmad ibn Hanbal, and Abu Hanifa. They have they've started the Islamic theory of rules and founded it. And this Islamic theory of rules is strongly influenced by the interpretations of these four wise men still today. And three of these four founders of legal schools, Malik ibn Anas, Ashafi and Ahmed ibn Hannibal, hold the opinion that everything that gives us drunkenness, even in small amounts, should be prohibited. That's a consensus they found in this area. They don't differ between wine and other alcoholic beverages. Abu Hanifa holds the view that there is a difference between wine and other alcoholic beverages. So he derives from that that only in a, an amount that makes you drunk of alcoholic beverages, apart from wine, should be prohibited. So wine is prohibited in general, the other alcoholic drinks only if you get drunk from them. So this would be prohibited according to his view. His pupils narrowed this down, this openness that he admitted and as it is admitted by the Quran itself, was restricted by his pupils. What we can say here is that the Quran gives a certain freedom, but that the interpretation which is done or has a sense in a certain context is difficult to transfer to other contexts and to continue it to other contexts, locations, times and periods. But what eras and what it in this case it, it remained a general prohibition of alcohol 
and in the uh, theory of rules of the Islam. Subtle, but nevertheless very relevant to everyday life problems of interpretations, as I pointed out before, clarify the challenges that the theological, practical subjects are facing. Both the theoretical and the practical subjects, concepts and terms have to be translated into everyday life so they are not banalized and not standardized, but they create a differentiated understanding of the world and reality. This is a challenge, especially for uh, religious education, because they have it has to deal with these areas of education, which is its main area of, of action. But not only on this philological and hermeneutical level, the call for translatability becomes clear, but also on the level of the real world life of Muslim, Muslim uh, juveniles themselves. I have here, from my recent research work, where a teeny says, male, 15 years old, is going to the A-level school. Yes, what I also just thought of, people say, yes, I don't know so much about Christianity, but on the other hand, I'm just 15 years old, I'm not 16 yet, but let's talk about alcohol and getting drunk. Once it was said, yes, once we are 16, then we just go somewhere and, and have a drink. And then another one says, but then Bilal cannot come with us because he's Muslim. But then I think, well, is it not the same with the Christians that they, for example, cannot drink alcohol? Or, or, is, this, or is it that the Islam is some religion that tells you everything what to do, whereas Christianity gives you freedom because they, are, they also have rules, don't they? Well, I am a Muslim, but there are things where, for example, I, I ask things, there are rights where I ask myself, well, why? No idea. And what I said, it would be make more sense if, to, if we could update the Quran. At this time, because the more time passes, the more difficult it becomes, because things have been described very unclearly. Well, he brings it down to the point, doesn't he? He wishes, he's looking for an update of Quran because of this asymmetrically perceived relation between tradition and situation that he explains here. Tradition the, and what is said and his own situation where there is a certain gap between these two. As you can see, the quote was set down in the same way he spoke. This was verbally without any punctuation because so the interpretation uh, full stops and commas lead to certain interpretations. So in this empirical research, you don't put commas and full stops. I hope you didn't, it didn't confuse you too much. Well then, Islamic theory and pedagogy, they have a translation task. To speak with Winfried Gebhardt, the task and the function of theology is to, to deal with the tension relation between tradition and situation. So we have to maintain the religious knowledge and to research there and examine, investigate it to deepen our knowledge. However, it cannot work if we start with the point of view that the truth, in quotation marks, whatever it is demand, remains truth forever and has only to be repeated again and again. The Quran itself offers uh, an inspiring potential. This openness enables the possibility of translatability into various contexts and gives us the possibility to put theology and Islamic theology into the real life world of Muslims in Germany. Theological concepts and terms, sources, are not room, spaces free of interpretation, texts and concepts from religious scriptures or historic sources should be viewed and understood in the historical 
context and critically ref reflect it and then translate it. If this process doesn't take place, terms are seen as things. So that means they are taken from their context or history and are put into objects or entities that are seen as themselves, just like the concepts of halal and haram. Whereas the human and its his or her actions are not no longer the foreground. Concepts and terms are thought independently of the subject, so the human is disempowered. This happens quite often with the concept of Islam. The Islam says, well, in Islam it is like this and that. This is as if the Islam would be outside of the subject and would have power on the subject rather than seeing it as an action or behavior of humans uh, to see or interpret the world. On the other hand, the fourth caliph, who died 1661, formulates hermeneutically and informed the Quran is a scripture which is hidden between two book covers which doesn't speak for itself. You need a translator and in fact it's humans that make this book speech. End of the quote. It can't be put clearer that the Islamic theology does have the duty of translation. The disciplines have faced a challenge to explain the terms of uh, Islamic religion in their context and to create a conscience for young Muslims to translate these terms into their everyday life and to integrate it, them into their everyday life. If this doesn't happen, the openness, the dynamics and the fluidity of the religions which empowers them to be translated into other times and contexts is getting lost and it will become a static system of individual and or collective um, differentiation from the others. And this development is something we see very clearly in modern times that Islam becomes more and more a static ideological system of a few groups only and is constructed in that way. The translation task of Islamic theology and religious pedagogy is crucial for these pedagogic uh, fields of action, for example, museums. Here the question is how Muslimic everyday objects can be exhibited and be explained to visitors and made readable for visitors. And would like to speak shortly about one example, but this will be done later by Ms. Schöne. She's the director of the museum and her team in the current exhibition of the Westphalian Museum of Religious Culture have tried, especially with the means of staging, with interviews and media stations and the contextualization of the artifacts with the history of the humans, they have attempted to, to exhibit Muslimic worlds and make them experienceable for the visitors. Here we have a few pictures. This is a special exhibition, had the title, He is a part of me, Muslimic living worlds in Germany, which took place between the 5th of May and 6th of September 2022. And one goal of this exhibition was that to give Muslims the word themselves and to have a, get a, to sensibilize them for bias-free interpretation of the religion. That's why people thought that this religious worlds of, or real life of this, of the people, of the Muslims living in Germany, that this should be put into the focus. So we have 12 Muslims with different migration histories and different beliefs and directions of the Muslim of different ages and sexes and they give us an inside view into their religious practice and their hopes and their fears and sorrows. 
Their practical beliefs is explained from an internal perspective, so it's not that we speak about Muslims. No, they explain, they themselves explain their beliefs. So it's not about the Islam or the Muslim. No, we see different types of uh, how religion is lived in practice. I think this is, should be the end now, because Dr. Schöne is going to say a few more words about this, so I don't want to speak about it in advance. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much for this insight. And I always tell my students, beware of the cliché trap. And this was a wonderful insight in how to not fall into this trap. And the example of alcohol and service and prayer was very interesting to me because it reminded me of a Christian tradition. During Reformation, the Christmas service was moved from midnight to uh, Christmas Eve. And this was because um, there were many drunk people in the Christmas service at midnight and they moved it to, earlier ta to an earlier time. So uh, structures uh, are very similar here. All right, let's continue immediately and hear from a philosopher's point of view and a philosophy education point of view. We have Professor Dr. René Torkler from the Kiel University, and his title is Talking About Religion Approaches from the Perspective of Didactics of Philosophy. So René Torkler is someone who knows how schools work, which is very important when you're an educationist. You know what you're talking about. So he studied philosophy, history, Dutch philology uh, for teaching at secondary schools. Um, he studied in Münster at the university there. And he wanted to have a more theoretical approach, uh, which is why in 2014 you did a PhD in at the University of Fechter. And then you had a junior professorship 2015 to 2019 for didactics of ethics at the Catholic University of Eichstätt, Ingolstadt. And since November of 2021, you've been professor and holder of the chair of philosophy and its didactics at the Christian Albrecht University in Kiel. And as before, I would like to mention one of your publications. Uh, we were at a conference in Eichstätt and we're still waiting for the conference book to be published. Uh, edited by Ulrich Kopacz and Miriam Schambeck about religious education in schools against the backdrop of less and less people assigning themselves to a confession. And René Torkler wrote an essay for this uh, book, which is called Religion as a Resource. And with this, we are right in the topic, and I'm very much looking forward to your presentation. Before we start with the content, I have a technical issue. Uh, sorry, I have, oh, no. I wanted to use my laptop. Is that okay? I think you can lower the volume a little bit. I think everybody can hear me just fine. All right, speaking about religion is the topic of my presentation. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. I feel very much uh, educated when 
I'm presented in such a way. So speaking about religion, it's not easy when you think about philosophy teaching. I said I will come from the point of view of a philosophy educator and I will talk about philosophy class. But I think that what I'm going to be speaking about can be applied to all contexts that see themselves as secular in all areas of public life. So I think there is this transferability. But um, when we look at museums, I would just give some pointers, but I'm no expert in that. And well, the questions I would like to ask today is why do we speak about religion in philosophy class? How, why should we do this? Or maybe not. And first of all, I would like to think about why do we even speak in philosophy class? And it's not as simple as it might sound. And then secondly, I want to address why we speak about religion in philosophy class. And then the interesting question, how should we do it? And um, I want to draw on Habermas reflections on the translation of religious speech and draw some conclusions from that. So why are we even speaking in philosophy class in schools? Philosophy is seen as a talking class and to philosophize is employed as a, as a word for digressing and speaking a lot. I don't want to um, criticize this use of the term. Wolf Refus, who's a, an educationist, did criticize that and he went into the maximum opposition and said, silence is philosophy. So in philosophy class, there should be spaces for silence and for reflective contemplation. Um, to many teachers that I've met, a silent class is strange and maybe unrealistic even when you think about school children. Um, but for many, class and teaching means speaking with each other. And because we have several people in class settings, it kind of just makes sense to talk to each other. So philosophy class is not different um, from other learning processes. But I think it is, we should take a look at the relation of philosophy and dialogue or conversation. And to ask ourselves, why do we do this? Why do we talk to each other? So speaking is not only something we do in class, but from the history of philosophy point of view, this idea has been around for a long time of needing to speak about philosophy. And the most famous example is Socrates himself, who didn't leave any written works. And for him, philosophy was very much oral. And his pupil, Platon, then created a model, a Socratic model, and the meaning of it for philosophy. And Platon um, wrote down, Plato wrote down large parts of his work in dialogue. And his teachers explained in dialogue that it is the birth of philosophical thoughts in dialogue, in conversation. And it's compared uh, in this very famous example to the work of midwives. They help uh, birth children and speaking to each other birth his philosophical thoughts. So Socrates describes this art of conversation in such a way that he says the most important thing about my art is the ability of, of verifying whether the thoughts of a young man are false or true. I cannot accept any of the false things and dismiss the truth. So for Socrates, it is always about verifying claims of truth. In this Socratic method, 
we have Socrates. getting insights and um, out, out of people. And this is a very famous example. And Le Leonard Nelson created this Socratic method in the 1920s. And just like Gustav Heckmann's contemplations on um, Socratic conversations, they have been included in philosophy teaching for many, many years. And for Hackman, it's also liberating yourself from error and gradually overcoming doubts as an approach to truth. And it is the verifying of, of claims of truth. And he often speaks of finding consensus. And this show some proximity to the consensus theory from discourse theory. And when we have these conditions of discourse, it is about creating a relationship between the conditions of conversation and a claim of truth. So these are some historical contemplations and reflections. They are not complete or exhaustive and more fragmented, but there's often a close relationship between philosophy and conversations and that the meaning or the purpose of talking to each other is verifying claims of truth. And I think this might be a point where it becomes evident that there is tension in philosophy and in re teaching religion. And I'll get back to that in a second. But let me address my second question now. Why do we talk about religion in philosophy class? There are some areas that are genuinely religious, like criticism of religion or philosophy of religion. That's obvious that we have these elements in philosophy class. But when it's about convictions, religious beliefs, why do we address that in philosophy class? Because it's called philosophy. So why is it part of it? Well, the first answer is very simple. It is politically intended and it's actually prescribed by law. In, and there are some differences in the different lander in Germany, but in all of them, religion is important when it comes to philosophy and criticism of religion, but also when it comes to convictions and holy scriptures and many more things. They're an integral part of the curricula of ethics and philosophy class. It's a bit more pronounced in the south than in the north, but it's a general statement, I think, that it can apply to all of Germany. And because we have these provisions provided by law, we have a report from the ministers of schools um, on the situation of ethics class in Germany, and it says, the subject of ethics is intended to provide a critical understanding of the values and norms that are effective in society, as well as access to philosophical and religious questions. And the goal of ethics instruction is to impart a basic ethical education and to enable pupils to form well-founded judgments and to act responsibly. And then it says something about conviction and tradition and them being able to draw orientation for thinking and acting from this class. It's a simple answer, but I think it raises more question than it actually answers, because apparently ethics and philosophy class should be seen as a place or a space where we have um, dialogue and exchange between secular and religious approaches to interpretation, and our society is much more pluralized. And the question is, or rather, the point I want to make is that this is not controversial at the forefront. But how should we address these questions and issues? And this comes to the content of the questions and their implementation into methodology and didactics. And wondering how you can implement it into didactics in an appropriate way for these classes. And this is one of the questions that come out of this. and. The report uh, doesn't really address the critical point 
of why and how religious questions, worldviews, convictions, traditions, etc., can contribute to um, being able to judge well and to act responsibly, because it is a class that is seen more as a secular class. So how can they provide sustainable orientation for thinking and acting? There's a tension here and examining religious beliefs. It's not clear how that can contribute to failing good judgment. The report doesn't specify that. And this is an obvious problem, clearly. And this is the problem that leads me to Jürgen Habermas. And I want to uh, share some of his reflections. He has published several texts on religion and the public and has several reflections on this, on how can religious and secular citizens um, coexist or and um, well I can only mention some of his points but societies can be called post-secular societies and there is a secular foundation and the state is has a duty of neutrality but um, at the same time religiously motivated values still exist in a long-term fashion, in a permanent fashion, in large groups of the society and they then spread to the public into politics and are part of the public examination of these topics. So we ha can agree that part of the society does have a religious foundation and the other part doesn't. This is the basic reflection of Habermas, but he doesn't specify who these people are in these two groups. If you're not quite sure, then this is not Habermas' fault, but um, just accept that we have these two groups for a moment. And that we do have these two groups uh, this has impacts on the processes of public opinion forming and the question is the claims of truth and standardization by these two groups how can you harmonize them and this question comes up because they have different foundations secular and religious motivations and reasoning and Habermas believes that this basic constellation of post-secular societies has certain requirements. He says both sides expect or can be expected to have a, an epistemic attitude about this. Because Habermas says as soon as you have this dialogue and mediation between them, we need complementary processes of learning and maybe promoting a, promoting a mentality shift. So both have certain burdens, that's how he calls it, and the state of law is affected by this as well. And having these two groups that have religious and secular foundations, and they use a language, and Habermas says it, they use a religious language. So the state of law cannot expect its society to simply not examine things from a secular point of view, that they only use understandable language. This would be a demand that for many religious people wouldn't be possible even. So this demand would be in conflict with the freedom of religion. But the secular state, as Habermas puts it, can, because of the freedom of religion, well, because we have the freedom of religion, we have and the the area of rules and norms um, 
Habermas argues that in this area of rules and norms, there should be only secular motivations. And Habermas says, everyone has to know and accept that beyond the institutional threshold that um, in parliaments, in courts, etc., we only have secular reasons. So Habermas says there is an institutional um, translation caveat. And this just means that the state needs to make sure that any decision the state has taken has to be phrased in a generally understandable language. So religious citizens have to accept that it is first translated into general language before it can be put into committees who will take decisions. And in secular contexts, and speaking about religion, is a question of translation for Habermas. And this stems from the conviction or the consensus that there can be some hidden or shrouded intuition and it is not a given because the possibility of this kind of translation for religious language and translating it into secular language has these pre-requirements that don't only affect religious citizens but also citizens who see themselves as secular and Habermas is very clear about this. As long as secular citizens remain convinced that religious traditions and religious communities are, in a sense, archaic, inherited from pre-modern societies, or a relic that reaches into the present, they can only regard religious freedom as a cultural kind of nature conservation for extinct species. And he calls this attitude secularist. And if religion is understood in this way, these encapsulated potentials of meaning are locked away and they are not accessible for pe people who do not believe or who have a different religion. And the example that is mentioned several times by Habermas is the translation of of the man being the, in the image of God into human dignity. I think somebody mentioned it last night as well, speaking about, so to speak of man as being created in the image of God can be effortlessly translated into secular statements that others would derive from the Kantian conception of autonomy or from a particular interpretation of what it means that persons are entitled to equal respect. But the success of these translations requires a, an attitude of openness and recognizing certain attitudes so that your own life could gather, gain more meaning. And if you are open to these meanings, it means that, or it requires that secular citizens are open in an epistemic way. And while secularization for religious citizens means they have to accept this general language next to their religious language and religious citizens are bilingual in a kind of way. They have to uh, dominate both languages and secular citizens have a kind of monolingualism. So this monolingualism of secular citizens is something that hinders the possibility of this translation. And that's really interesting for both um, philosophy class application and for museums as well. And it's not only hindering translation, but Habermas says it's only hindering, also hindering public or the success of processes of public opinion. And Habermas uh, had a statement that was quoted many times 
um, which is a liberal culture can even expect secularized citizens to participate in efforts to translate relevant contributions from religious to publicly accessible language. And Habermas' thesis of translatability is an idea or a, a reflection that is important for uh, didactics of philosophy as well. And his reflections have consequences for philosophy teaching. Um, but, well, correct me if I'm wrong, but we can apply it to museum pedagogy as well, or transfer it, I believe, because they're both informal forms of public, of the public, and where secular and religious life realities meet, and where um, the mediation between these two ways of life can be successful or not. So both are spaces that enable complementary processes of learning or can hinder it. It can work out or it cannot work out. And we can draw this parallel between philosophy teaching and museum pedagogy or museum examinations of religion. And uh, central importance is applied to the shift of mentality. If uh, we do not have this epistemic status, then it will not be possible to uh, access these m meanings. And if you see religion only as a traditional way of life and that sees a philosophy as overcoming outdated concepts of religion, then um, that would rather be hindering the exploration of religious meaning in philosophy class. And I think we have to admit that this is actually an attitude we see quite a lot in philosophy teaching. And I remember the article of addressed in a colleague he said religion is not so important and he said the values of democracy and freedom and human rights had not been won through religion but against religion. So this is a very clear example of secularist opinions and secularist attitudes and I think it's very simple thinking and I wouldn't want to follow that. And then where you can learn from Habermas that the secularist understanding of overcoming religious ways of life um, only reasoned by secular motives, this is an attitude already that religious citizens could perceive, rightfully so, as respectless, as lack of respect. and. This is a lack of respect we see in the public. Uh, we are the progress and you are outdated. But Habermas also points out that philosophy has always um, appropriated semantics from Jewish Christian tradition. And at another point he says, philosophy has reasons to be disposed to learn from religious uh, traditions. But it's also a, a learning approach of democracy because if you close yourself off against any of these possible meanings in this learning process that could stem from religion, then you do not enter the dialogue and would even endanger the integrative function of public opinion and the consequence for didactics of philosophy should be that we have certain themes from religion that can be drawn drawn from and can be taken into philosophy class with an effort of translation and we need to have of course traditions that um, have an impact on our society that should be the ones we talk about. And then Habermas said there's a shift of mentality towards epistemic openness. I think this is the key point or, well, if we don't 
if we ignore this warning from Habermas, then religion just becomes an artifact of curiosity, um, an object of curiosity and an exhibit in the worst sense. We just heard about reification and I think this is what we should avoid in philosophy teaching. It's, but of course there is a certain distance that should be applied. Um, but following Habermas, I think we can state that we need this kind of translation of religious convictions in the public opinion into a publicly accessible language and to be able to push for this complementary learning process that Habermas mentioned and also to enable the functioning of democratic processes. Thank you. Thank you so much, and thank you very much for this enormous input that we had this morning. It's a pity that our colleague Ms. Harman could not be here, that's what it is. But I would like to ask Samuel Ulfert and Mr. and Guido Meyer, who just left, I would like to ask him to the front to have this panel discussion. I would like to I'm trying to put my first ideas together. So we're having some responsive in the first small panel so that everybody can say summarize things from your own perspective. And then we have a Q and A round. Uh, please do not have any other uh, counter presentations. So we have a fruitful talk for all of us and discussion. That's, yes. So this microphone. I would like to ask you, please, that around 5 past 12, you call for order so that we can so that we can end the public part and have our lunch break and that we can see the great examples from the Museum of Dr. Schöne later. I think we have to wait for one panelist. There he is. I see him approaching. Can you please close the door? Yes. Great. You have, haven't missed anything important. So let's see for keywords. Look for keywords. Of course, they're not complete. They're personal views from myself, from these presentations. In the presentation of Guido Meyer, semiotic turn and the contradiction a juxtaposition of a pseudo metaphorical language, the language that can be misused as a language of power. I don't want to address the good metaphysics, and I don't want to see it as a language of power. And then there was a second term that was longing, so this gap, and to put it into the center, I think I said we, we are going to make a response round when you went here. At the colleague Nahama, I noticed the dignity of the original language, this high meaning. This is something that became clear that Arabic is much more important than new, the old ancient Greek. And Hebrew and Aramaic is something we study as theologians. But in fact, and honestly, we don't use it in, uh, uh, apart from in scientific discourse. And the Bible translation of Martin Luther has reach the biblical value in the meantime. Well, this is from the presentation of Mr. Hamann and from and Farmer Ulfert. Yes, of course, the challenge of translation, but also the term of context is something that is very exciting for all of us, especially has a significant meaning for all of us at the various locations where we work. And I remember one sentence, I hope I wrote it down correctly. It's just about that human is not disempowered by power. And I think this is a very important duty. And I'm looking into the didactics of philosophy, whether there are some cliches, is that 
this is something that is done by religion. And then finally, really talk like, again, we talk about translation. Translation of religious speech as a task of a democratic, pluralistic society in the context of respect and in speech conditions with claims of truth that cannot be called irrational and how to deal with this. These are my thoughts and I would like to ask you to, as, as a type of response, to give us your thoughts. Is this microphone turned on, so please, could you start, yes? It's always very difficult if I, when I have to start. I have to, I have to deal with and interpret and contextualize what I have heard today. And I could, from all the presentations, there were many things I could learn for myself, especially in terms of the relation, uh, translation of religious speech into secular context and into everyday life, which was also something of uh, I put a focus on and this contemporary, contemporary learning processes. I think this it is very important that religion should be seen as a resource for democratic uh, processes of dealing with each other because religion is, as Habermas said, there are people who have a who are religious or are musicians. Okay, that's not what Habermas says. That's just my interpretation. Yes, he did say that. All right. Well then, von Weber said it, oh, it and other other stones. For example, there are different Muslim intellectuals who see democracy from a Muslim perspective and the democratic values and secular values to see them from a religious Islamic perspective and to justify them. You don't have to justify them from a religious perspective, but they say they're people who, if, if you can underline this with religion, then you can reach their hearts then you can reach their inner beliefs. That is why I think it's important that, as we saw, religion is nothing that disappears. Religion is, does exist, even if it's not visible all the time. There are people who are religiously oriented and to reach them and to make them aware of democratic systems and to accept them is something very important. So from this point, it was very inspiring, actually, all these presentations I heard today. Yes, um, I would like to add something to reach the hearts. And in this context, it is important for me to point out that we use many terms in different, with different meanings, especially in terms of translatability or translations. We all have well spoke of deciphering, I think that's something different than putting things or transmitting things into real life and to ask whether religious reasons can be transferred into secular normative uh, claims. So at this point we have to be very careful that we do not confuse one with the other and uh, that we are too, uh, we all want to de uh, translate, we all want to decipher things, and we want different things, and there are different terms for these different things, and different contexts for these. Maybe just a, a remark that we have to be careful here. Something I discussed with Guido Meyer before, the parletra, this term of parletra, I asked him, does it, go beyond the linguistically talented animal of Aristotle, where progress and the extra value of such a term is addressed. We have many things that are very close to each other. Maybe the, we can use this discussion to 
clarify this. I would like to discuss a point that I noticed in both for in all four uh, presentations, but which wasn't highlighted. Difference, difference is the term in modern philosophy, and I would like to see it or describe it as a moment of resistance, resistance against uh, the interpretation of Islamic groups to give the text more opportunities of um, interpretation, resistance against a secular society that's using secularity in a wrong meaning, resistance against imaginary hardnesses, that's how I called it, and resistance against, that's how I understood the Jewish colleague, against an, a religion that is only written and what is applicable is the spoken word. So religious language has to be seen also somehow in its and understood in its resistance. So it was very exciting for me how Habermas, what, how he says, the multidimensionality of religious expression, this dialogue, this necessary dialogue is something we all uh, Agree, but religion is is a multidimensional reality mode that is translated or is hard to translate into everyday language, and that is why dialogue is becoming more more difficult. And this type of difference is something I would like to point out. Well, due to the lack of time, and we have. <laughs> We definitely have to have another event. And this is something we haven't worked out enough, but I think this is a red line that connects all of us. Yeah, a red line. What I noticed as a Catholic religious teacher that Habermas is the source, we all quote in Germany, all my students can confirm this, there's no religious lecture without any quote from Habermas. At the same time, this is exactly the problem. When I read Habermas, and the way I understand him, for him, it is a problem of language and communication to have a free democra uh, uh, communication in a democratic society. So I agree with you. But this leads us also to my question, which wasn't here in this morning, but will be in this afternoon. How can we see the difference, the, the, the multitude of different in the difference in a cultural middle class society that this difference remains intact but at the same time that we create a democratic um, togetherness especially for them in Germany this is a very substantial question here in central Germany and in East Germany it's also a question how can we involve secular persons. We now live in an environment where we can see that 80 to 85 percent of our neighbors, for example, on the streets of Wittenberg, are secular people. They don't have any confession. So that's an important task that this cultural good can be communicated in such a way that it is not related with power and that it is discussed publicly. This is a question I'm interested in. That's why we have the symposium. How can we, well, school is our profession, but how can we use it in a cultural context and in an institution, of course, which is a middle-class institution where I have to assume that I only reach certain people, but how can we communicate it into a society that visits museums and how can we motivate this discourse in society? Yes, maybe one word about Habermas as the source for all of us. I'm, I'm quite careful with him because he also he was very much criticized for his topos of translation. There are a few authors, for example, Charles Taylor, who criticize him very strongly. And I think it is justified that such a translation cannot be done without any breaks. We spoke about the rest before that remains. And of course you can say this is what happens in any translation. I think something we discussed last night, that things cannot be, never be trans transmitted from one language into another. And of course that 
a religious language cannot be transmitted into secular language without any gaps or breaks. And in philosophy classes, which is the context that this is, but maybe this is also the streets here in Wittenberg, where this could happen, where we should address the fact that we have to do more than just using this concept of secular language, which is not very vibrant. So for those who are looking from an external perspective, it is not very hard to grasp, actually. And there are contexts where this can, might work better. And this is a note of that I wanted to make in this uh, speech of last night. Uh, the colleague Leah Rosenberg um, explained to us an alternative where she said, you don't go to the museum to have a religious experience, but maybe you do have an ex a religious experience. This might happen, but there are contexts where it is not about where the religious experience cannot be uh, motivated from the outside and where it's not wanted. But there's an alternative. On the one hand, there's this religious experience. On the other hand, you can just go to the museum to be a, a consumer. So the translation could be a possibility to find uh, a medium way where it's not necessarily medium uh, religious experience and not merely consumption. Maybe there's the, the notion of resource that was used by François Julien in this discussion. We introduced it in this discussion. The resources of Christianity are accessible. Can they be accessible without believing? I think to use these resources requires more than just consumption or just acknowledging it. But it would be less than just a religious experience. So there are contexts. That's all I want to say. There are many contexts where more would be good and, uh, and applicable, but there are contexts where it would be adequate to limit oneself. Yes, well, regarding your question, my idea is, well, yesterday Miss Lear explained or said something about art and poetry, something that I think is very important to maintain this difference and to maintain the democratic society with the aid of approaches, artistic, poetic uh, approaches, as for example, the rabbi today who said, yes, singing, the chanting, of religious texts. It's something we also have in the Muslim world, the recitation of the um, Quran. So there are aesthetic issues. And maybe they motivate you, they move you, and you have a religious experience, but they are means to produce this, maybe. I would like to have a, a very small moment to bring the perspective from from an international procedure from an international perspective i think the national context play an important role i think you addressed this issue before for example i believe that a museum in france will be different than in germany if you if they both um, exhibit um, religious art so la system in france would prohibit many things so the problem you were talking about is a European problem, and I would even go as far as to say it's a worldwide problem, which here has to be seen under the focus of East German um, circumstances. That's just a perspective I wanted to point out. Yes, I would like to take over this perspective because it is going to lead us to the Symposium 2024. How can religion be put on stage in a public museum? And I already <laughs> see the list of, of speakers of the symposium. Well, I would like to now ask for the thoughts of the audience. And my colleague is bringing the microphone to you. Yes. 
Okay, I have various questions to Mr. Torkler. First of all, what can be understood as secular language? Does it exist at all? Second, what is philosophy in difference to religion? So I have an idea what it means for me, so for myself. Philosophy is the open process of thinking. Religion should also be open, but has more positive attempts to answer problems. So we need both of it. We need philosophy and all religion needs philosophy in order to keep the process of thinking open. Then, a question to Mr. Meyer, what is a picture? Are pictures always affirmative compared to speaking? If I look at pieces of art, they are not affirmative, in my opinion. Second, I think that also a word can be an image and that a letter can be an image. So if we speak about uh, the an iconism in Islam, letters are um, decorated, then the Jewish uh, presentation, I was very impressed by this holistic language that, first of all, language becomes reality if I speak loudly and the relation between music and language, which means that it's not only verbal, but also nonverbal. The whole physical aspect of it is, has to be included to bring the whole human into play. And to look at it, what does it mean for, for us today, even within a, a so-called secular context? Thank you very much. Well, I'm still holding the microphone, that's what I'm going to say. Well, you asked, what is secular or secular language? What is it? The question is, very uh, justified. We spoke about language as a cultural phenomena and discussed it. What Habermas means is a reduced context which, which focuses on reasoning. It's not about speaking different uh, dictionaries. No, it's about different types of reasoning and justification. So X, Y should be in our political uh, common being regulated in such a way because, and then after this because, there would be the place for, uh, for this reasoning in a secular language and would not be dependent whether you have a confession of a certain religious belief. No, it should be accessible for everybody and had, would be universalistic. That's what it is meant, what is meant. So there is not the secular language as such in the meaning of something that is religious and historical aseptic. I think this does not exist. And that's also what says what Habermas says. Yes, regarding the question, what is an image or a picture? Günther Lange, I almost said the, the Pope of picture of religious didactics, would say a picture is an artistically painted space. I'm not using this definition in my uh, presentation. I would say a picture is, has to be seen under the symbolization modus uh, that is surrounded by society where certain types of pictures, these affirmative types that we encounter here and there and everywhere, these are very far away from the artistic pictures that have exactly this effect that make evoke questions in us. But what I have to find out also is that religious pedagogic, peda pedagogy and education uses pictures and creates learning processes, but unfortunately our everyday life, I say 
uh, of other pictures are not artistic pictures. And if we look at the everyday pictures of pupils and students, then we have to involve them in a didactic way. But at many places I look at religious books, at media, something that does not happen very often. If I speak of a picture and I agree with you completely, then I speak about these 98 or let's say 95 or even 90 percent of pictures which are sh perceived very shortly and very briefly and have this hidden impression of it is as it is and that's what they uh, what they say and of course with the language there's metaphors which are very much like pictures and they have this other mode and that's how they work maybe i should have differentiated this a bit more but i think we agree in the and there was a second question that i have forgotten now maybe one of the colleagues or was it were these all the quest your questions okay thank you then all right okay so i would like to ask the audience there we have five more minutes for your questions please then Please go ahead. Yeah, we have one question. I cannot summarize all the presentations today and speeches, but I know that I have certain terms that I cannot understand or that motivate me to think. Um, Sorry, there was a strange noise here. I could not translate this. I'm talking about, I'll go back to the translation now. The title of the book is Modifying or Changing Things by Telling Stories. And that's something what happened today in the presentation today. It's about Peter Handke and the tension between theology and literary, liter literature science. And by telling things about us, we can change things. And it is my impression now that there are many interactions taking place here and that will be taking place. Another thing is between ethical language and theological language, there is the question for me, where does the ethical language come from? Does it, can it not be that it comes from the uh, religious language? Oh, but it also reminds me of the fathers and mothers of the basic law in Germany, they were not only theologians. And at the same time, I have the feeling that we still have to do that with the things that were explained to fulfill these things with content, inter-religious or in, in secular, and I think we have a still still a long way to go here and a long path for work. But I also know that the basic law in the European context is, does still exist in the European context. It is, might be interesting how this will is addressed uh, in other contexts based on this reality. Well, this question is a bit in the same direction as the first one. I believe from this Habermas perspective, uh, I completely agree with you, as would Habermas, I think, because at the end of the day, it's a term of the human dignity. What is discussed as human dignity is something that might be from universal, universal, solistically formulated uh, intuitions but which can also be formulated in religious speech and m which might also be the source for this so talking about language again it's not about ethical or secular language or that they are something as something existing but it's rather a consensus project and i believe there's, there are many points for criticism here, but I think, despite all this criticism on these ideas of translatability, 
what we have to do is we have to try it. We have the necessary or there's a requirement to translate our theories into contexts that are able for consensus, even though there remain certain things that cannot be translated. So that a translation is not fully possible does not mean that it is not meaningful and does not make any sense. I think this is what Habermann says, despite all justified criticism and all reductionalism that I still see here. I would put it in a way between Hartmut Rosa and Hans Rohr, where do values come from? Values emerge from moments of self-effectiveness, moments where I where I see myself, how I affect others. My And the second aspect is what is important that from a theological perspective, speaking about these moments, these self-moments, and not from this rational level. For me as a religious teacher, religion is just a second moment. First of all, we have the religious experience, and then we have the values that can be derived therefrom. And this seems to be makes sense for me. I don't want to see religion through the glasses of ethics. Ethics is something that we share. And by the way, I think Tiedemann or Tiedemann, you quoted them, I would really emphasize this person because we have these moments where religion um, avoided that. But we had these moments where there was a hindrance for these moments of religiousness and we shall not reduce them. We had, it's a thorn in our shoe, and that's something we have to speak about, and that's part of the ethic we talk about. But for me, ethic is, ethics are always a second moment. Well, for me, I can only agree to that, actually, because we should not make things nicer as they are and leave out the difficult moments, especially in terms of what religion can uh, affect. And I think these such quotes have to be discussed openly. Yeah, I would like to be have a concrete question to Ms. Holthard. And that's where my idea focuses, the idea of this two days symposium. And something we discussed for the last few years, and is the necessity of this translation task was very well founded by you. And my question is, does this already happen? Do you have the opportunities to do this and how? Maybe we can have a three-day symposium event for this, would be nice, but yeah, how is it done? Well, yes, especially when speaking about Islamic theology as a scientific discipline at German universities, that's a starting point and an important point and which mot a motivation to start this translation and to continue this translation works because this scientific investigation in German language is something for the Muslims living here. It is very important for them because also many, if they are religious, they have questions that have to be have, that have a meaning in this context and maybe in Turkey or somewhere else in the world there are other questions in other contexts so the Islamic theology has to find answers that work in this context and that do not come or are not translated from another time but that are made that are continued and have a progress so it's not only a translation that have a progress and to address the problems of today. So in religious education, I always start with the question, what is religion? What is Islam? Because this is the, or these terms have so many facets and aspects. We are oriented very much by the or European concept of religion, which was created and originated in, in Europe and is characterized by Christianity. This also is part of translation. Translation is has many facets. And I think that Islamic theologically and religion education 
religious education is can is quite quite good at initializing this at initiating this. Well, I'm not go speaking as a host, but as a religious Catholic religious teacher. This translation work, this heuristic concept here with all its problematics, is something in the secular context exists. And as you as you have asked, is there something happening in the school context? Many things are happening. Religious teachers that we that we teach at the university in Halle Wittenberg, and as I can say, Protestant and Catholic students, we tried to prepare them, especially for this discussion. So the basic question is, Trinity is a nice thing. Now please explain Trinity to your neighbor in three sentences and why it is important for you, because your neighbor will not listen for much more time. So that's where the task of translation starts. It will remain rudimentary, but it's a very exciting and interesting task. Not only interreligiously, but also into the secular world. So we have this field of tension that also includes the, the tension of exhibiting religion in a museum. How can I transport an idea of a whole world of lives with personal relations and that I only see by a reference object of a group of confession? That have the same belief and how can I communicate this into a society which a is not Christian or not Muslim or not Jewish or is doesn't believe in any religion or has nothing to do with religion so this is a very interesting task and that is why I think well the, I think the German system is with this religion classes and that is done by the uh, religious groups it's a great concept because religion can be experienced as performance, as a performance that is seen in the public school discourse and which has to be compliant with the rules of public schools. The same applies also to the public museum, so it's the discourse can be, and it's also anchored in this plurality of a modern society, but this, I would like to really strengthen this model because this means we don't have any backroom discourses and the didactics um, uh, can be made strong. We have to have another group of subjects where this discourse can take place, but I think we can do something here. And I believe that you spoke about institutions. It's a great story how it works in Germany. I receive a sign. We have no more questions. I think there was a sign about having lunch now, and that I think with the museum we're going to address it at another point. But in at this panel with three persons here, the fourth person will receive it in another way. I would like to say thank you, and also to give all of you a present to thank you about exhibiting religion. This is from the last conference. So. I should encourage you to continue taking part in these symposiums. So, enjoy your lunch break. I just wanted to say very elegantly, welcome back to the audience here in this room and in front of the screens. Let's now after this lunch break, so we can get back to the topics of the symposium. As you might have noticed, Herr Lohse and myself, we are sharing the work. He was responsible for the highly intellectual presentations of this morning, but I'm doing the basic work, the work in the museum, in exhibitions and presentations in museums, so we're coming. <laughs> is this, sorry, is this my own computer? So getting to the practical part, uh, how religions uh, is the attempt uh, to communicate religious language in museums and maybe to translate it. I just want to talk about it very briefly by 
uh, calling the four presentations. We're going to start, and this is different from the original program, with priest Hannes Langbein from the Society of Contemporary Art, Arteon, and the title is Excuse me, please, artistic approaches towards the language of religion. Then we have priest Veit Dinkelacker from the uh, um, Experience Museum of the Bible. And what he said yesterday, we're talking about the gender asterisks that are prominent now in German language and hard to translate into English. So, but it is about whether God is male or female or diverse. And there's an exhibition regarding this point about gender diversity in this museum. After that, we're going to have another coffee break. And then we'll have Professor Dr. Daniela Blum from the RWTH Aachen about crosses and material domes, religious speech and dealing with depictions of violence. And last but not least, Dr. Stefan Reim, who is one of the co-hosts today and director of Luther Memorial Foundation in Saxony-Anhalt, language event Luther, on the lookout for playful learning scenarios. And then we're going to see the 10 pictures from this exhibition in Telte, and then we have something to discuss later in our panels. Dear Hannes, now. What I would like to I would like to introduce you now. After you studied even Protestant theology in Heidelberg, Princeton and Berlin, you started practical work as a referent in the cultural office of EKD. An early step into this topic of teaching culture through art. Then you had your PhD at the Institute of Pictural Science in Rostock, then you had a were Weiker in Berlin Spandau, and after that you became a priest and worked at the St. Matthias Foundation at the Mathe Church at the Cultural Forum in Berlin, which is a very renowned place for culture in Berlin. And since 2018, you're the director of this Foundation St. Matthias Foundation. However, you were invited today as the president of the Society for Contemporary Art and Church called Arteon, which was founded in 1992, and I'm sure you're going to tell us something about this foundation later. But to summarize it, it is dedicated to the dialogue between contemporary art and the churches. And in the self-perception of Arteon, church and art are seen as brothers and sisters. And that's how would you like to give us your ideas under the title, excuse me please, Artistic Approaches Towards the Language of Religion. Well, thank you very much, Stefan, for this very kind introduction. I I'm not quite sure if I'm the perfect person for this, speaking about museums, because uh, as you've put it, I am pastor at Matthias Church, and our exhibition space is church at the same time, so it's kind of like a hybrid. And during my presentation, I will speak uh, about this and draw from this perspective and uh, you've invited me as president of the Society of Contemporary Art, which was founded in 1992, as you've said. So we're celebrating our anniversary this year. We're turning 30. And when you look at the founding fathers of our society, I think it is one of the societies that have been initiating this dialogue between art and church and have um, initiated some processes in the state churches and they have been commissioning or they have officers for art um, I myself am uh, the commissioner for the regional church in Berlin, Brandenburg and Oberlausitz, the ECBO 
Um, many people have contributed to this network and it's in the German speaking region, so Germany, Austria and Switzerland. And I think this really helped. This morning was really, really interesting and I could um, comment on many things and I'm still reflecting on this debate we had in the end and I thought about, okay, what's the role of the arts in this translation work of translating into secular contexts and into religious contexts. I personally hold the hope and well, I worked on this with a friend of mine and I hope that next to ethical understanding and communication and dogmatic communication, we can have a f an aesthetic form of dialogue. Uh, and it's so important and interesting because I would say that the arts are the area that m makes it possible. Well, you've put it in such a nice way to have this resistance, this resistivity and having this dimension of the unspeakable. And that's a very interesting area for all formats of dialogue towards the secular society, but also when it comes to interreligious dialogue. As you've noticed, this theme of unspeakability and the question of understanding or getting an idea of understanding this unspeakable, um, the title of my presentation is, excuse me, artistic approaches to the language of religion. And I didn't just randomly choose this title, but I just copied it. Because we have it above our altar in the St. Matthias Church. It was done by Via Lewandowski, the Berlin artist, a concept artist, working with the different media. And when you take another look at the church, he worked with sound installations. So we have 80 loudspeakers that are placed in the church and they all have their, can speak in their own voice. And the artist invited people from our community. Well, we're not a registered community, it's a foundation, so it's a bit different. Um, but we do have people who come and visit us frequently and he talked to these people and asked them if they could contribute to this sound installation with their favorite psalms. So they went to a recording studio and read these psalms and he then modified the recordings in such a way when you go through the church sometimes you feel like there's some tweeting and twittering of birds and at other points you feel like you're in a hospital because things are beeping or it's like Morse code. But all of that was the language recordings and he just modified it in such a way that you're in a collage of sound. Because the artist says language, well, we've heard about that already, language is much more than just passing on information. It's also, um, noise, noises animals make, misunderstanding and not understanding is part of the core of work of Via Lewandowski. And for my presentation, I would like to consider whether religious language always has to go hand in hand with the not understandable or the hardly understandable and maybe it shares this dimension with artistic communication this is why these two dimensions are very much apt and uh, a good fit for for communication in the dialogue and we'll look at we'll look at the religious communication and artistic communication and also at artistic approaches and access to uh, the language of religion so number one is religious communication. That in religious communication there, that there can be misunderstandings was shown wonderfully by Axel Hacker and his 
work the white Negro Wumba bar. If you don't know it, it's a collection of hearings. And there are some phrases you don't really understand. And oh, it's misheard texts. Sorry, it's not hearings. It's something that was misheard. So he heard a version of Erkern and he thought, what is that place? Where should that be? Excuse me? And there it was just a joke. But there is an underlying dimension because the liturgical context, not only of Catholic services, but also Protestant services, um, the liturgy doesn't always lead to understanding because many things are hard to understand if we have Greek, Hebrew, the Hallelujah. We just know that we use it, but for people who are unfamiliar, this is tricky. And then we have these acoustic conditions in some ch churches and a complex phrasing by the prayer leaders or the service leaders. But still, there are people who after a sermon they did not understand at all, they're still happy and go home comforted. I've heard this many times, so it seems to be kind of the atmosphere and empathy, sympathy. Uh, I've heard it from a mosque in Berlin as well. The imam said, many don't speak Arabic. They don't understand what we're saying, but it's, it feels like home to them. And this is why they just come back over and over again. And a question that can be asked if, is if religious communication isn't always about the not understandable. Because words and not being understood is, is the experience of the disciples when they listen to Jesus, because Jesus speaks from a perspective they don't share yet. And um, we should speak of God, but we can't as humans. So this quote points to the difficult communication between God and humans. We are supposed to speak, but we can't. And then we should know that we can't speak of him and honor God with that. A really, really important uh, sentence from my first semester at university. Bruno Latour, a French sociologist who recently passed away, pointed out that religious communication is a language of love. It's less about information and more about relationships. I love you. It's not only information, but establishment and underlining of the quality of a relationship. And when living beings speak to each other, it's very individual and others might have a hard time understanding their private language they share. When it comes to understandability of religious language, Apostle Paul also discussed this in his letter to the Corinthians in chapter 14 because apparently there had been an ecstatic highly individual form of religious speaking established among them and speaking in tongues glossolalia is still seen as one of the highest forms of spiritual speaking that outsiders can't or can only very difficultly um, understand and Paul advocates for a prophetic speech and that speaking in tongues would only be for yourself but speaking prophetic is creating community and according to Paul all of this was possible and legitimate and semantic and non-semantic language are both forms of the linguistic expression of religion but at the end of the day, for the community, there should be understandable language. 
And what's interesting about this, and now we're getting to artistic communication, is that Bazon Prok, philosophy performer, who was around in the 70s already, he took Paul literally and saw his letter as an as considerations of artistic theory because artistic expression is speaking in tongues according to him because it's highly individual and these forms of expression cannot be accessed or understood without previous knowledge and then in comparison to the prophetic speech uh, he said we need to translate art or mediate art that should make highly individualized forms of expression accessible to the general public without drowning out its individuality. A poem cannot be explained without um, analyzing its lyrical form and a riddle cannot be explained without losing the riddle. And this is the tension that we have in this field of mm, explaining art. Bazard Brock in the 1970s um, had the Documenta visitor schools that tried to explain these highly individual expression forms uh, in these exhibitions. And trying to not place them in a context or a structure so it can be maybe seen as a form of action teaching or lecture performance Basson Brock wanted to follow the footsteps of Paul and his considerations of speaking in tongues and understandable speech and of course mediating between the two is difficult and it is all often questions Eugen Blume the former director of the Hamburger Bahnhof was against any kind of art explanation in his exhibitions because he thought well art speaks for itself and it loses its poetic force if it's contextualized into horizons of understanding and I, we once had a small discussion about the origin of the artwork because he said the more lonely and more isolated the piece of art is the simpler well not simply in the more isolated it is, then there's this tension between revelation and apologetism. So there can be life worldly contexts, but he is rather in favor of self interpretation of the divine message of salvation. Paul Tillich's approach of correlation describes a middle ground of combining these two sides. Paul Tillich was also ordained in our St. Matthew's Church. And artists that work with the medium of language are often more involved with this tension because the medium of language and scripture and writing offers this opportunity of understanding and mediating and then um, art has this experience of not living up to this expectation. You might know the US American artist Lawrence Wiener who works with writing and letters and is very clearly readable. He's doing typeface work. And there are these messages that are hard to decipher, drawn out from a stone. And then you can associate. But without context, 
These are mysterious messages. A determination of where what falls offside rests. Well, Wiener works with extremely riddled and mysterious messages open to interpretation. And they are very readable. There are similar works by Barbara Krüger, for example, who uses the very bold element of uh, type and it's uh, overpowering and ad absurdum. It's kind of like an overkill. It's hard to get a sense of orientation. You can go in there and then there are also religious connotations. I want to inside of me to the praying body that whispers save me to the dead body that is hard to dispose of, etc. This is a version of artistic practice with language that is readable, but somehow because of its presentation, it is not understandable simply. What's similar and also very different is Misha Kobal, in Düssel a Düsseldorf-based artist doing a lot with light up writing and they kind of flicker so parts of the word disappear and then they reappear so this is changing between dystopia and utopia going back and forth uh, which is playing with the uh, fragility and multifacetedness of realities and we can look go back to use of boys because his work with language, with written language, in the context of performances on these school blackboards, with the where we have the suggestion of understandability, and then we have these graphs, which turn writing into image. Um, wow, it's really complex playing with understandability and on the other hand non-understandability and there's a Berlin lyricist Stefan Pop he recently looked at these graphs and structured them put them placed them in a certain order and translated them into print but still keeping their graphic element but creating more transparency. It was a strange attempt, which uh, from my point of view wasn't really successful. So these artists, I've picked them, I've chosen them mainly because they are artists who have worked in churches, with church spaces. Uh, Josef Beuys, I didn't show a picture of this, but last year we had a Beuys exhibition in our church. But I want to stick to these type works, writing works. I couldn't find a better picture. This was Lawrence Wiener once again uh, from the Düsseldorf Johannes Church, where Lawrence Wiener used um, the sentence that you can read here in English. So Johannes Church is a city church in Düsseldorf and this was the opening back then and I'll just show, present some projects. This is our Matthews Church writing work by Misha Kubal, who used uh, light up writing once again. And you have to imagine it flickering. So the brackets, uh, well, it says unfinished and the un part is in brackets and sometimes uh, the brackets are there and sometimes they are not. So it's going back and forth between the different meanings of uh, finite and infinite. And then we have Via Lewandowski that has a similar principle. 
It's in the Bamberger Dom between the two towers. And you can see that it switches between God and good, good and God. It's, and this is very typical for these neon signs. It's flickering and you think, okay, because of an error or because it's faulty, good turns into God and the other way around. So that's wonderful about Via Lewandowski's works. They always have this kind of joke, inside a joke, but a very deep meaning. And the, there's a theme for this faulty, flawed material. This is just taken from the studio. We didn't have, uh, I don't have a picture of the f presentation. We invited him to Brandenburg and der Havel. And he, the artist did voice recognition, speech recognition, and modified the beginning of the Gospel of John. So we have speakers and microphones that speak to each other. In the beginning, there was the word and the word with, with, with God, etc. And the speech recognition recognized it and then passed it on to the next and then to the next. And you can imagine what happens. It's, things are, are lost. And these texts get stranger and stranger. And it's kind of like a continuous lecture. And he pr took the minutes of the texts that created. And uh, they were in the Brandenburger Dom. And for days and weeks and months, this Gospel of John was passed through the speech recognition devices. And you can imagine that in from many points of views, this was really interesting. Sorry, I wanted to stay with this slide. Um, to me and others, this topic of flaws and how is religious communication flawed and what's its relation to understandability and non-understandability, I'm very much interested in that. Uh, we're celebrating 500 years of the Bible translation and Luther focused on the clarity of scripture and to me when I have this background of looking into artistic approaches to religious language and Luther thought that the holy scripture is clear and the translation is an explanation towards the German, but then it's also clear because it interprets itself and the hermeneutic principle applied. This is what Luther said. And as soon as it's translated, we don't need any more experts to clarify what it means or make it understandable. And it was kind of an independization from the experts of the clergy towards uh, readability and understandability and availability of the Holy Scriptures in the sense of every believer is a priest, which is very understandable for the time, but it is ignoring the blind spots of the Holy Scripture or just ignores these darker passages and just um, goes via the, the light and at the end of the day in many parts the clarity does kind of pu get pushed to the background and both sides of religious language so understandability and non-understandability in religious language had always been in dialogue interdependent and this is what the artists remind us of. So, via Lewandowski, one more time. Um, a while ago, he in the word God, there's a sign of omission, this sign of omission that the Jews use, and he 
gave it this kind of memorial, this very um, noble memorial, and he said it's so tiny and it's not really recognized and he said this should sparkle like a jewel and have its own glow so against the backdrop of this work the lutheran concept of clarity can be re-examined because when you have clarities in latin we don't only have clarity and um clear meaning then we but also light and glowing and shimmer with religious language from my point of view um, should have and is characterized by I have got no idea how much time I've got left I can speak more but I can also um, stop speaking and we can speak to each other thank you Yes, exactly. Well, uh, in differentiation from what we usually do, we ask Hannes Langbein to answer some questions right after his presentation and have to enter into a short discussion because he has to leave pretty soon. He has this relevant dome in Brandenburg is where he has to be present. And that is why we are going to speak with him now. So if you have any questions, so please raise them now. You now have the possibility to discuss with him regarding understandability, misunderstandings, translatability, would you like to ask something or add something? Well, first of all, thank you very much that you made it possible because our foundation, St. Matthäus of the Church in Berlin, has its seat in Brandenburg at the Dome. And once a year there's this chapter day where we have to present the work of this foundation. And this has to be done this afternoon. So thanks that I could still come. Miss Bloom. I'll just pass the microphone on to you. Yes, thank you very much. I would like to ask you what are we going to do with Luther's claritas and the artistic approaches towards contemporary art, which are which is very popular that remains unclear. We have this they cannot do, have anything in common with this religious claritas. Well, I can only explain from our context in Berlin, well, and with a view not only to art, but especially in this Protestant context, it seems important that there are signs of a memory in both liturgy and in the church, and that they remain and let us remember this dimension of un, not uh, misunderstandability. And as we said, mentioned before, we take it Luther's translations for granted. And, for example, there's a theologian, Philip Stilber, who dealt with these questions of pictures and this topic. And after this debate, whether there is something like the picture of a deity of and he said that the translation of luther is pretty close to idealizing the written word itself so what they said is the picture as you said that's what it is and as you also explained it from the islamic perspective or area of course with a view to the biblical scriptures, nothing is as such. And that's something we learned the original languages as theologic theologians to reflect on this. But if we invite artists to the church, then that's gone. For example, we have a series which is called My Psalm, 
where we invite contemporary poets and ask them to uh, create new psalms and create versions of the psalms and variants. And they are a critical element itself. If As soon as you have a variant, then you have to ask yourself in which direction we are going. So much about to this point for the moment. Well, yes, of course, I was interested in this poem. Hildemin, for example, says, that's my most favorite poet. She's, she wrote a text called Double Interpretations, and she says the poem pretends something, but the omissions are filled or the gaps are filled by those who are seeing this poem. That's why she started an experiment and the poets sh were asked to interpret their own poems and to have uh, another uh, interpretation. And they should not get into contact with each other. And after that, they found out that the interpretations done by third persons were the best ones. And that's simply because the author him or herself knows too much how the poem was created in the first place. And she says, the artist, and I think this also applies to pieces of art or to densified religious experiences, it is that it is put into a picture which is, so to say, like an ice block that has to be uh, warmed. To disappear so so much about the autonomy of the piece of art which is gone away from the artist itself as soon as the piece of art was created it's autonomous and then if the artist interprets this piece of art it becomes more liquid so there are new situations of life in which this poem impresses me much more or in another way than before some For some poems it's not the time, but it's just, for others, it's just right now the perfect moment. And this is the same with, with things we cannot explain, that they are so interesting, that even those people who express something also have something that you cannot fetch up with, and that someone else, a third person, understands the artist better than the artist himself. I was doing a seminar where we used these metaphors and depicted them, and someone else was asked, requested to interpret this installation. And it was extremely interesting. If you notice, what, what have you seen in this picture? Something I haven't noticed at all. And that's so interesting. This, this, Education. Education means, in this case, yes, we are going to prepare it for those who are too stupid. They can They cannot do this. That's why it, we have to explain it to them as if we would know. Well, first of all, the artist himself doesn't know it exactly. And those who are trying to discuss about it, well, it's all within these borders, actually, and this, these limitations. Yes, exactly. Well, it wasn't actually a question, but an addition. Yeah, I just wanted to speak about this educational aspect and its limitations. And that's what I wanted to point out. That's all. Well, that's exactly my question. I have a huge problem if museums, museums have educational divisions. Museum pedagogy is something I see very problematic. Some Also, I don't want to do this at school. I want to educate people, which is a process. I just don't want to transmit. Education is, well, Germany, Germany is a very rich language here because it's, you give impulses. That's how I would use it, impulses to learn something. So I, like, I would rather speak about communication divisions in the museum who can, who can enable the experience of education. I'm extremely convinced that you cannot just transmit beliefs. You cannot, there's a 
you can get into contact with beliefs and confessions. The job, for example, of a religious teacher, and maybe that can be transported into the museum context, to uh, to prepare the runway for God. God himself has to land, but and it depends whether we turn off the right lights on the on the runways. I'm also thinking of a colleague from the Catholic uh, University. In, and who asked, what is the task of theology compared to religion science? And that's my question. So if we speak about religion in museums and exhibitions, it's pointing at the last thing cannot be explained. That at the end of the day, our attempts describe the margin of what is in the center. And to speak about omnipotent. And so this, this gap sign that we see here is something very important for the public um, context. And because we have this, this is a context reason why there should be religion classes at public schools. To get something, to make aware of people aware of something that doesn't have to be accepted by everybody, but that is a possibility of thinking according to Habermas, in a pluralistic, public democratic society, and it has to be there. And I thank you very much because it clarifies what we are doing here today. And maybe very briefly, this piece, what I like about it is that it is extremely beautiful. I always want to find verbs for the beauty of the complex, because it's something that tends, well, at least there are, areas of society who see complexity as a problem. But this is something to be trained to enjoy complexity and the beauty. And complex, in this case, means to see the gaps that have to be filled again and in different ways. So the inner iconism is something is not you should not make a picture no, it's you should not only make one picture, you have to, well, this gap is something like a catalyzer. It depends on the theory of reception. Well, exactly, this gap has to be filled again and again. And exactly here we have the end iconism and what it means to have more, more pictures that make each other more relative. So one picture cannot be without the other one. That's exactly the point. What's good about it, artists, for example, like this, Livagovsky, find ways of expressing this, which themselves are pictures. So this glimmer and the brightness, it seems very simple, but there's much that you can interpret here. I would like to put a logical order here I'm thinking about if the, well, artists, what Leah Rosenberg just said, art is open to interpretation. You cannot misunderstand art. Good point. So if art and religious language have to be translated at the end of the day is is it that religious language cannot be misinter misinterpreted? A short remark from my side, and that is, if you speak about the interpretation of poems, Domain says that a poem gives us the guideline, which means it, there is respect in terms of what is written there. I'm not fantasizing about whatever, but what I think about different things about these guidelines. And she says they are multi forms, which means it takes up various and numerous interpretations, a piece of art that is. So each good interpretation strengthens the poem in this aspect, full stop. Another thing, why does it have this shape? It looks like an Arabic wow. And wow means wa means and. 
No, no. So if you if you write God and leave out the O and instead of it write this, and wow is the Arabic letter for O, which means und. So it means God and and and, which is extremely interesting. And 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 yes, <laughs> well the good thing about it is that the und itself is has pluralistic uh, forms. And as a connecting point, it goes into various directions. Well, that's exactly where we wanted to get to. This piece of art, which comes from a Latin typography, creates associations. And now, this is important. These associations can be contextualized into this Arabic sign system. I can contextualize them in the Latin system. And that's why they lose their um, arbitrary aspects so I can say they're they're like gods because they speak to be themselves and these are levels they might exist to build hearts but if I enter into communication I need context and in terms of religious language I would make point out very clearly that there's a differentiality that there are differences in religious languages <laughs> So, this can only happen, we can only build a community if we understand and can interpret this religious speech very well. So, people can have a job and to enter into a communication process and a religious communication process, which works in a certain context, a prayer, a sermon, a song, a personal confession, completely different. If it's not to be supposed arbitrary, it needs the exchange of this context. And this is interesting for the context of the museum. Yes. Yes, that's the famous final word. Now we all know why we are not go enter into the questions and answers after each presentation. Johannes, would you like to have a f the final word? No, I think I'll leave it to Harold. Well then, just for the moment, thank you very much for this for this discussion and thank you very much Hannes for this impulse let's say which was quite effective you were asked whether you already published something <laughs> in this book in this series so thank you very much for your appreciation thank you so now let's continue with Now we're coming from the presence here in this room. We're going to the and the way of presenting things. We're getting back, going back to the virtual room. You will see Mr. Dinkelacker next to me, who's going to give us the next presentation. And I'm not going to try again to see the title, maybe he will give us a hint how we should understand it. That's why I'm just going to say a few words about this person. He studied Protestant theology at the universities Bonn, Heidelberg and Frankfurt. I think it was Frankfurt or mine, then in Tübingen. After the first theological examination, he worked as at the Lutheran Refugees Office in New York, in the US. Then he, there was a time where he was a preacher in Herborn and an assistant at the preacher seminar in Herborn and at the Protestant seminar in Heilbronn. And then there's something in his CV, which is quite nice, but it just says 2001, 2002 parental leaving and guest here in Cairo at the al Hara University. Something very special, <laughs> in particular in this combination. Then he became reverend at the uh, church in Rummenheim. He came to the Bible Museum, Experience Museum in 
Heilberg, where he now is the head of this museum. So I'd like to welcome Mr. Reverend Veit Dinkelacker on screen. Hello, my name is Veit Dinkelacker. Thank you very much for the introduction, Mr. Bayer, and thank, thanks for having me at this conference. I hope you can un hear me very well. And I'm going to present the work of the museum. And despite COVID, that is quite impressive. I'm going to talk about an exhibition to give you an insight how religious language is exhibited in Frankfurt. Please let me have a few remarks. As a Lutheran coming from the southwest of Germany, it is very interesting to see the various approaches towards religion and language, Western from a Jewish perspective, from an Islamic perspective, and how can we do this in a Bible museum? A museum on the holy word is something completely different than a museum where the liturgy of the church are presented in another museum. So it's a Protestant approach that we are having here. So at the same no, in advance, the question we might be answering later can a quote from the Bible be exhibited and create a wow effect in a museum so that somebody really who is not very religiously religious creates an openness to perceive this and then how can this be done and achieved? Also, I would like to remind of something that is important for us in Frankfurt. The Holy Word have a critical potential that we already saw today, and the biblical language in, f in a few models of thinking is critical towards religion. So that's criticism in terms of the, the functionaries of religion, but also in terms of practiced religion, theory and pract practice, both parts of, in both parts of the Bible. So you might ask yourselves, whether the most important sentences of the Bible can be seen in a critical view as religious speech, or can they be seen as criticism of religion. We hope as a museum that we can make the Bible speak to everybody, regardless whether they are religious or not. And regarding the education of contents of religious communities, for example, in religion classes, what the meaning of these classes regarding in terms of the constitution of Germany, the capability to, uh, to utter criticism in terms of society, but also in biblical language. And this was one of the arguments to, that for the freedom of religion and to give this to transfer this, be, yeah, as we learn from the times of the Nazi terror, that we need something else, and the critical potential, and as I might say, there are, these are something that is for the religion. Maybe this is something that's also, and that's going to be my topic, the almost religious over exaggeration in the gender debate. Now, I'm going to start my presentation where I'm going to tell you more about the exhibition. I hope it's going to work out, work. As you can see here, this is the entrance of our museum in Frankfurt. We kept the rainbow here. The Bibelhaus Erlebnis Museum exists since 2003 in Frankfurt. It is a private museum which is funded by the Frankfurt Bible Society, which is an association 
from the early days, from 1800. And in the 20 years, last 20 years, it was uh, supported very much by the Protestant Church of Hesse and Nassau, the city of Frankfurt and the bank Metzler. That's where we receive financial support, support from. It is an archaeological, well, it's not an art museum and also not a museum of books. It's an archaeological museum plus the uh, cultural history with a strong focus on didactics. That's why it was called from the right, from the beginning, Bible House Experience Museum. Since 2010, the museum has permanent loans from the Israeli Antiques Administration. 75% of our visitors are under 18 and special attention received was received 2015 when we had numerous um, experience stations in order to understand the Lutheran Bible as a language event and was very effective. And just as a short inside view, but now we are going to be more concrete regarding the exhibition. And I'm not going to say it like this. We are speaking about WMD, gender diversity in biblical times, since biblical times. And as we put the asterisk here, it's not an idea from the Bible House, but Elizabeth Schistler, for instance, American theologians proposed this in 1994 just in English to leave out the uh, vowel in God and to put an asterisk inside and as a notion that to to refer to the anarchism and to signalize that we if we speak about God that we mean all genders and sexes. In 2021, the exhibition was very well received in the media. And something I would like to underline, it can still be seen, this exhibition can still be seen online. So you can get an idea of the practical work under pandemic circumstances and since autumn we also have it as a pop-up exhibition uh, which is much smaller and not as valuable as the exhibition in the second half of 2021 with many loads from all over the world and this can be seen now in the city of Lich so it's still traveling and being well received. Then we have Gerhard Goda from the Museum of European World Cultures in Berlin, which is called Conchita Wurst on a Crescent, which was very enjoyable for us. Something that can be seen also in this pop-up exhibition. It's from 2014. I'm not going to interpret it for the moment because it speaks for itself. I just want to mention that our colleagues in Berlin, due to the relations with our um, due to the connection with the title of our exhibition, they made it a permanent exhibition where you can see it or will be presented as a loan for the next half year. When doing the research for this presentation, I was looking for the gender diversity in the history, especially in terms of archaeology. That's where we started from as our starting point. It was very fruitful, but also for the history of the texts, which is an example for me how open these texts can suddenly be if you manage to ask uncommon questions. At the bottom you also see uh, the remark on www pop -up got w -m -d -d -e. that's the internet address for the virtual exhibition. God is not an old man with a white beard, is he? If I said this at the beginning of a tour, something, well, of course, you can visit the exhibition 
at your own, but many of the visitors uh, preferred a guided tour. So we're working in Frankfurt, we're still working on this topic. So if I ask, God is not an old man with a white beard, I always received a, a cringe or reaction. Some are nodding, some to say I don't know. And then you're in the middle of a discussion or a how people perceive and how people imagine God. And then people who think they have nothing to do with God do have an opinion what God might look like. This topic is also presented in the permanent exhibition and also in the pop-up exhibition where we show case a few objects and we make reference in the context of this pop-up exhibition we reference make reference also to the virtual exhibition where you can jump into the topic and look at various objects what we represent is something well what we exhibit is language so god and this gender asterisk is something we that is ongoing in the entire exhibition and I was asked, do we all have to write God with this gender asterisk? Which is quite funny that something like this happens. No, it's what we say. You can write the word God as you would like to. But we do it in exactly this way because there's a reason for it. Because God is not a man. And then one of the translation versions, as we can see in the Greek Bible, it says God is a human, but of course there's a difference and a difference that we are presenting in this exhibition. And for many people, this is a has a strong learning effect. From Genesis 49, we speak about the blessing of Johan, an interesting figure, because in Judaism, as a rabbi once told me, uh, the, there are six sexes known, and Joseph seems to be a figure who was supposed to be female but was war born as a man and had many female um, features. He was wearing colorful clothes and so on. So it's not coming out of the nowhere that Jacob blesses his son with the blessing of breast and womb. So it's a blessing from God, from breast and womb. So the womb that is meant here is the womb where the childs are born from. And one of our objects that were presented here, it's a figure that you see at the bottom right, that we had to return, of course, but it's from the museum from the late Bronze era, and it's a fertility deity who's opening her womb, and there's also the gesture of a blessing that can be seen here. And as can be seen here, that there were deities that were not male but were extremely female or in the times before the Bible existed and this is proven in history but some people are very uh, surprised by this. Excuse me for a moment, I have to... As a Bible House Experience Museum, it is our claim to put the Bible into the center of our research. And if we, we see here the smartphone picture, and we have uh, the virtual exhibition, is dedicated to archaeological findings, which are in a strange contrast to the standard pictures of biblical religion especially 2,800 years ago in the houses of the Bible, we see 
very often figures that are female goddesses, which is in contrast to the text, because here on this display, it is put at, uh, in the translation from 2016, it says, don't make a picture of male or female being. But the findings in houses and graves of that time, you could say, yes, that this prohibition was required because there were so many pictures, especially pictures of female beings. Why that was the case is another question. What we want to say is that goddesses in old Israel were not always seen as male, male persons. The human shall not make a representation of gods, but God is making a representation, male and female. That is the picture. So God created man to its likeness. And this is an extract from his pop-up display that we're still showing here. And I want to tell, say two things, what we're going to do in our tours, and which is very surprising every now and then, even though it just means to read it once. In contrast to the most biblical trans translations of the Bible, it was said in the translation of 2016 that God created human, male and female, where it was said in the previous translation, God created humans as men and women. Does it make a difference? Yes. We found a red, we found a relation here in the last 2000 years in Islam and Judaism that there is a correlation, especially in the interpretation of the rabbis, that male and female can be understood as adjectives, whereas Adam is thought of as male and female. Even in ancient times, Abram androgynous was it. So it was not a couple, it was all in one, male and female. Medieval of course, we do not say you have to read now Genesis, but there's a possibility to read this and interpret it like this, that gender diversity was possible. So the first human was understood as androgynous. What's interesting is, and this platonic interpretation, then you see why in, in the late medieval times we see illustrations from the Kobeck Bible from 1483, the German translation. It's a common depiction of the creation that Eva was created. But what you can see here is that God doesn't create Eva from the rib of the man, but from the side of the man. Or that is, just, she's just one side of the whole being. So the history of art has this figure of thinking, and which can also be found in Judaism. And which was seen as a unit in the beginning, and it was separated later. So that's what you see, that this is Platon model is going to be used through the times, just as a finding. Another attempt to show you three displays, displays that can be seen in the pop-up exhibition. So, do we have an extract from a certain book? Um, and in fact, there's an early exegetic tradition. I would say it's the oldest comment we have from the Pentateuch of the Torah, Peter von Alexandrin says, I, sorry, the sound quality of this is very bad, so please excuse me if the translation cannot be very well. Um, so both Genesis stories can be seen very well. We now saw the displays. I just want to give you two more examples, how we do it in the permanent exhibition. 
very prominent is here hermaphrodites and androgynous in ancient times and we have illustrations of the seven days when God made humans then we have androgyno and Abraham opposed to this we find the likeness of God in this staging in this permanent exhibition of the biblical language can be discovered in two ways on the wall you see what we call God's likeness and it's a collage of the word pictures that the Bible uses for God where we see it's we're talking about God's right arm God's throat God's eyes what they can see in God's ear can hear those in misery and you can open this flaps where it says for example humans are not living from the bed alone and God also uh, well God here is presented as an hermaphrodite and what again we had this text of God blessing you from breast and womb and the grace of God is in relation to Rechem which is where children are born from so we have the compassionate father the kind father and all of these things are part of the exhibition and we then can have a dialogue about this and then we have different translations from the bible of the bible into german genesis 1 to 7 we have the hebrew translation we have these two adjectives of male and female and then we have another translation from 1912 he created them man and woman and some people say well god only wanted one father father mother and child but uh, we have to point out that neither in garden eden nor anywhere else they talk about children right to finish off what was really important to learn about was the perspective of people who live in this gender diversity and this translation of saying man or woman or male or female it does really make a difference and you can see that in the exhibition we have these interviews you can see the qr codes uh, that are also part of the pop-up exhibition three people who do not identify with the gender they were assigned at birth we have intersex and trans um, participants and Lucy Fight said if p humans were created as men and women then me as an intersex person am I not a creation of God uh, we have Ines Paul Baumann um, there's more to read about this person as well is regressing to this male female Adam and Ines Paul said well when I realized that the world is split up into men and women and I didn't want to be either of these two categories I heard the verse there is no Jew or Greek slave or free male or female you're all one in Jesus Christ and I thought I'm not man or woman so this is a very new perspective on how to read the Bible and these were just some highlights from the work we're doing online as well in the exhibition and also with the pop-up exhibition thank you very much for uh, giving me the opportunity to present this to you we have our catalog as well where everything is explained in more detail if this was a little bit too fast for you thank you very much for your attention
All right. Thank you very much, Mr. Dinkelacker, for joining us here. Although you unfortunately had to be online and couldn't speak to us from the room. It was very interesting to hear this. Mr. Schwill has already said we are very disciplined. So we listened to your presentation and I hope that later when we have a the talk, the debate, then we can have you back for that. That would be wonderful. Can you hear me? Apparently not. All right. We'll try to get him back later for the debate. Sorry, I can't really hear you. What was the question? Well, the last question was if you'd like to come back later for the debate. Sure, I can stay, yeah. So we'll continue now with the program that we'll have an early coffee break. And then we'll have two more presentations with an insight into the exhibition in Telkte, and then we'll have our final discussion. Thank you very much, Mr. Dinkelacker, for making this possible. And thank you to our technicians, our tech staff, for making this work. Um, this conference would not have been possible three to four years ago. We wouldn't have imagined that it were possible. So all the best, uh, thank you, and hope you recover quickly. See you later, bye. And here in the room, we'll have a coffee break now. We start in the last round of of presentations. And it is my pleasure to introduce Professor Dr. Daniela Bloom, again from the RWTH Aachen University. Something that has to be done recently. And in terms of this very young colleague, I'd like to say something about her scientific career, especially the years when she studied, show how young she is here today, also as a speaker. From 2005 to 2011, she studied Catholic theology and political science and psychology in Tübingen and Rome, something she graduated from. And after that, she was, from 2014 to 2019, she was scientific assistant at the professorship of medium and new uh, church history in Tübingen. Since 2019, she started her career in the museum. She was working as a scientific assistant in the De Cézanne Museum of Rottenburg. And as, you, as it is obvious from this presentation, it is based on the experiences made when she was working in this museum in Rottenburg. And since April 2022, so that's this year, she is a pro professor at the Institute for Catholic Theology at the RWTH Aachen University. We are very pleased to have you here today and thank you very much for your presentation. Thank you very much for your kind words and thank you very much for this topic because it takes me back to the place I worked at for three years and where I had to work with these kinds of images that are not cool at all, not even for middle class educated audiences. So my title is Crosses and Martyrdoms, Religious Speech and Confrontation with Depictions of Violence in the Diözesan Museum of Rottenburg. One thing I have learned in these museum tours, in this specific religious context, the children have better eyes, like little seismographs. They spot even the smallest depictions of physical violence and want to know something about it. In a niche of the museum, 
there is a tiny picture. But with children, you cannot just simply walk past it. It is the circumcision of Christ eight days after his birth. The circumcision of Christ was a decisive event for the medi medieval theologians. It was seen as confirmation that Christ had taken on a human body. And in the foreground you can see Mary and Joseph with the aged Simeon as godfather. This uh, means that the later representation of Jesus in the temple flows into this picture. And in the background we have a cantor. But in the foreground we see someone with a small curved knife. It's the Mohel circumcising and performing a ritual act on the child. Two barely visible streams of red blood are collected in a bowl. Children who grow up in secular contexts are usually unaware of the phenomenon depicted here, circumcision, or of the fact, or they don't know that this ritual still exists in both Jewish and Muslim contexts. But as inconspicuous as the streams of blood are, with children they can, you cannot just walk past such an image. And my thesis is, neither should you. Such depictions of physical violence against humans are often found in late medieval and early modern sacral art because often it is martyrs you see and they often suffer a violent death and they are taken from churches and chapels and after iconoclasm, redesign or renovation they were taken to museums and this contextualization in life explains why most of the works of have a profoundly religious language and in the museum they lack this sacral environment of origin but also the original function of this image which is between biblia pauperum biblical interpretation and ornamental function at this point i do not want to open up the old opposition between cult image and art image but I do want to remind you that the images I work with rather belong to the cult image, the sacral context, religious language. And this um, taking it away from its original place, especially in relation to representations of physical and mental violence, leads to speechlessness or embarrassedly walking past these representations. And in this lecture, I would like to argue that these violent and cruel images offer the possibilities to address core contents of Christianity, but also the human condition. So first of all, I have three examples. In late medieval and early modern art, depictions of physical violence can be categorized, and I would distinguish between four basic types. First, we have everyday acts such as circumcision, but these are relatively rare. Secondly, we have pictorial works and sculptures of a second group showing sick or injured extras. And the best known representation is certainly that of the beggar who meets St. Martin and who shares his coat with him. In the Middle Ages, this beggar is often depicted as severely marked. Here, for example, with the life-threatening and cruel disease of Antony's fire, which causes the beggar to slowly lose his legs. And he's already lost his ears. Much more common are the other two groups, which is depictions of martyrdom and depictions of Jesus' passion especially his crucifixion. I would like to begin by taking a look with you at three example images of these two groups. So the first example is Sebastian, the slender figure of a young man nestled against a tree trunk. While the trees behind it have leaves, the trees bare, and two ropes or invisible barely visible ropes indicate that he is tied to the tree. He is awaiting death in a dance-like posture. The gracefully raised arm 
are more reminiscent of ballet. The body hardly shows any traces of violence. Sebastian is wearing only a white loincloth, reminiscent of Jesus, and a cloak, and his head is adorned with an, well, his, his ivory body is decorated with beautiful shaped arrows. And the red cloak gives the figure an enormous depth of meaning. The blood red color is reminiscent of the martyrdom that Sebastian is about to face, but on the other hand, it was reminiscent of the red cloak that was put on Jesus by the soldiers after the scourging. But also the red cloak that the risen Christ wears in Christian pictorial tradition. You can see here from this de depiction how similar Sebastian is depicted here. Naked body, red cloak, wounds. And another type of image is important for this depiction, the extremely popular depiction of Christ as the man of sorrows from the Middle Ages. It points to the part of the gospel where Jesus meets Thomas and he only uh, believes him or Thomas only believes his resurrection when once he has laid his hands in the wounds. So it is a depiction of Jesus presenting his wounds and all of these pictorial traditions of the man of sorrows and the risen Christ play a role in Sebastian. Sebastian is designed very similarly to the man of sorrows, naked with a loincloth and a cloak and with the emphasis on the side wound. So the red cloak is in the center of the painting in terms of color. It is not blood, but a red cloak. We have this man, this martyr, who can follow in the footsteps of Jesus. So in Sebastian, people recognized Christ. This is the biblical side. But there's also an artistic side, because Sebastian's image is accompanied with another panel. And the shooters with a bow are not shown as torturers. But what you can see here is that the violence is downplayed and the weapons are aesthetically pleasing to look at. And when you look at this panel without looking at the Sebastian panel, you see three courtly men with ornaments and you see harmonizing colors and only the clothes um, point to the context of hunting. And I think, and that's interesting, I think, um, that on the pictorial level, all drama and violence is removed from the in image. Sebastian is seen as a supertemporal saint. It's a deeply symbolic, biblical, pictorial language. And we see a beautiful and almost naked man and not a martyrdom from the biblical imagery not the cruel termination of a young life. And here this late medieval depiction is not an exception, but almost typical. Well, you could say there are more cruel things. Yes, of course, but I would argue and say this, these are things that are brutal at first glance. It is Saint Acadius and the 11,000 martyrs. We have these thorns and spikes going through the bodies of these people. Yes, but these spikes do not cause a lot of blood to be lost. It's just some trickle. And on the other hand, these twisted bodies and twisted arms and legs is unnatural. And it's also 
striking that we are that they're gazing upwards and some are gazing into the distance and their faces do not reflect fear or pain they seem rather calm and optimistic they are already seeing the light of Christ that is promised to them after the death of martyrdom we don't see streams of blood suffering faces and the spikes are nicely placed and then we have another layer we have scholars on the left and they are trying to interpret this uh, happening and positioning themselves in relation to what is happening so violence is only presented in a limited way. It is unrealistically presented, only symbolically, and thirdly, it's already introduced into a discourse. The two pictures shown are cruel only at first sight, because both show a violent death um, and they show maimed bodies, but they don't show the point of time where violence takes place. They don't show how Sebastian is shot with arrows and the martyrs are impaled on the spikes. So it is already biblical interpretation. And they lead to the core of the Christian faith, which is believing in a crucified, risen Son of God. This context of passion, death and resurrection is projected onto the violent death of the martyrs. In the first image, it's above all the fabric and the textiles. And the, the second one, it's the lines of sight and the spikes. So instead of drama, they show per perspectives of hope that lies in witnessing death for Christ. In this respect, these interpreted death lead us to the primordial death the death of Jesus, the cruelest instrument of torture. And they lead us back to the cross. Which leads me to my second point, an interpretation in the light of the cross. We all know that depictions of the cross of the crucifix have come pretty late. So in late antiquity um, and medieval times, the crosses are an interpretation of the cross in light of resurrection. Jesus Christ, whom the Council of Nicaea confesses to be both man and God, is depicted here in his divinity. And in the course of the Middle Ages, however, this changes. More and more the man on the cross is represented. His suffering, his bloodshed, his innocent death, his wounds. And the cruelty of Jesus' death is an omnipresent pictorial theme in the late Middle Ages. Whether the aspects of suffering and death or hope and resurrection are emphasized in the depictions of the cross, the cross represents a core of Christianity. On the one hand, it shows that death is not ultimate, but opens a path to another life. On the other hand, all sacred representations of the cross show a wounded human being. All corporeality, all human wounds and thus all experiences of vulnerability are included in the Christian hope of resurrection. That is the central message of crosses and these images of martyrs. When you take visitors to a museum and you look at these depictions with them and talk to them, about their perspectives of interpretation, then these at first glance cruel depictions lead into an absolute core topoi of Christian faith, but not only in, from a perspective of religious speech, but also existential speech. And this leads me to my last example. This is something I want to present to you. It's from the Diözesan Museum Rottenburg. I introduced my talk with the circumcision scene that children can't walk past. And this is something even adults can't walk past. It is a truly violent and cruel depiction. 
in terms of pictorial composition, it has nothing to do with the less cruel previous depictions from the Middle Ages. We see violence here, we see a corpus that is marred with numerous plague bombs. Scraps of flesh hang down, blood flows from the wounds. These so-called plague crosses have shown Jesus' scourge wounds as plague bombs since uh, the Middle Ages. Typical signs of the bubonic plague are swellings caused by enlarged lymph nodes. They burst and then you have um, secretion. Of course, once again, this is unrealistic according to our sources because Jesus did not die of the plague. But depicting him with plague bombs leads to fundamental Christian conviction, all suffering, all wounds, all illnesses and pain, and all experiences of social exclusion associated with the plague are suspended in the fate of Jesus on the cross. The Son of God goes into the last depths of human existence, a physically cruel and socially ostracized death so that no pain has to be misunderstood and consoled anymore. In the worst pain, the cross of Christ and also the perspective of hope connected with it gives comfort. It's interesting, where does this cross come from? Apparently it was hanging in a plague hospital in the Algoi. So these violent depictions had their specific place in a violent space, cruel space rather. So it's not shown as his abstract fate of a son of God, but it's much more into the human abyss. And these are experiences of depth of being a human being. And I have experienced with children and adults in contemplating and describing this cross one can get into thinking, into discussing about suffering and death, about hope and hopelessness. And I've rarely experienced anything comparable in school or university or a church service. And what Guido Meyer presented to us this morning, this immediacy of looking at a picture, an image, and this participatory engagement with it leads to existential speech or religious speech. But it's not without prerequisites. We need to have the right atmosphere. Highly frequented museums with thousands of visitors are maybe less suitable than a diocesan museum in the province. But above all, it needs a guide who does not shy away from this discourse. Whether this necessarily requires one's own Christian confession or sympathy for Christianity, I cannot judge. But these are risky conversations, conversations that demand the whole person, not just as a professional art historian. And this um, takes me to Bruno Latour. Hannes Langbein already mentioned him. In 2002, uh, he published an essay about religious speech. It was called Jubilé. And he said that religious speech has become difficult in general, not only in late modernism, but in general. Latour diagnoses a double discomfort, a double shame in religious speech. I quote, the means to speak at once simply and subtly about religious matters have been taken from us. They have become either complicated, archaeological, learned, or so trivial, sanctimonious and simplistic, that one's tears come from pity. Latour thus distinguishes two modes of speech in the present. The dominant communication model is the idiom of science and research. He uses the example of a map and the territory it depicts. A map has no resemblance to the depicted territory, but it helps to orient oneself and provides reliable information. So this scientific and research way of speaking m puts reality into a certain mold. And the second mode of speech is 
technical communication, which is how we deal with knowledge very objectively and passing on information. Both forms of communication, the scientific and the technical and informative communication, have overshadowed religious speech. But according to Latour, religious speech functions differently. A religious language that mainly explains or informs is either too complicated or too simple. So religious speech is not exhausted in conveying information and repeating what has always been said. Religious speech consists, first of all, in the address, in the vocative, which, after all, does not transmit anything, but only tries to establish a relationship to a transcendent other, but also to other persons. But if religious speech is a question of relationship, it is precisely this factor, however, that makes religious speech highly risky. I quote Latour, there's no religious speech that is not hesitant, stuttering. And in religious speech is not about information or understanding, but about words that change, transform and shake up. For Latour, the central goal of religious speech is to overcome the chasm that opens up between the religious event and the speakers or listeners present and to bring both into relation. According to Latour, religious speech is a relational event specific to person, time and place. Hubertus Halfers wrote about this in 1968 already. He said, religious speech should stop informing and start, I quote, opening up a world in its hidden, albeit effective, in sustaining depth. Latour's conception of religious speech is about the highly preca precarious relationship of a statement to the one who wants to utter it. And his example, Hannes Langbein already mentioned this, is the language between lovers. And of course, museum communication certainly does not come close to this form of communication. But according to Latour, religious language succeeds when it gives a decisive twist to a well-known sentence, adds just a little something that gives it the seal of the authentic. Religious speech depends on making a relationship present, end of quote. When we apply it to our context, religious speech in a museum succeed when the people who work with Christian sacral art in a museum feel in some way addressed by Christianity or by, by the messages where their language only informs, instructs and explains about sacred works of art no religious speech in the actual sense succeeds. This is very ambitious and maybe it's not true because Latour lived in another world than us. But Latour is an interesting thinker when it comes to religious speech. And I would like to end with a short excerpt. On the one hand, Latour is one of the earliest representatives of materialism. To him, everything in belief and religion is material. And he was very much interested in materials. And to him, every work of art is an, an active person or an active object. And religious speech, as soon as it asks us to give up our contemporariness, it is a dead language. So the works of art I have shown them, I have shown now, have found a radically contemporary language for their crisis-ridden times. The crucified man with the plague bombs shows this most impressively. And religious speech needs consistent contemporaneity. And that is what museum objects provide us for the past. And if in the museum we manage to decipher religious speech of another time and discover the contemporaneity of a piece of a work of art, then we discover something historic, but also something about being human, existing and ambivalency. And that is maybe not quite as ambitious anymore.
Thank you very much. Yes, well, thank you very much. I was so impressed by this presentation. I almost missed. Uh, <laughs> that was supposed to be a compliment. Yeah, that's the way I understood it. Well, yes, I may have to say goodbye to Miss Olfert. She has to leave already, which is quite a pity. Nevertheless, it was a pleasure having you here, and we hope to see you again here. Thank you very much. May I now give you an introduction to the next presentation? We'll see. Not the host here, but Wittenberg is joining us today. We are here in Wittenberg, and now we have something very specific for this place. Presented by Dr. Stefan Reim. He's the head and director, something we spoke about yesterday, of the Foundation Luther Memorials in Saxon, uh, Saxony Anhalt. And it's a bit like carrying owls to Athens. If you speak about, if you say something about Stefan Reim, he, the focus of his science is Philip Melanchthon. And during the tour we had yesterday, we spoke about the person of Philip Melanchthon and we were introduced into his history, so it sort of speaks for itself. Stefan Reim made his PhD in 1978 in Heidelberg about Melanchthon's Greek history and from 1987 until 97 he was a custos at the Melanchthon House in Breton and something that was also mentioned in yesterday's guided tour. And since 1994, he's the head of the Reuchlin Research uh, Department in Heidelberg. So, a few, just a few short things and brief things about your person, and many things we have done together and have experienced together. But now we would like to hear your introduction to the language event of Luther. Yes, thank you very much. I'm very happy. And at the beginning, there's Wittenberg. And I'm really happy that I can tell you something about a very extraordinary exhibition, which might not even be an exhibition. So, I would like to show you a format that we try to develop since a couple of years. You can see it as a, an exhibition where everybody can join, but we try to apply it to cultural historical topics. You see here pop-up Kranach. On the left you see a girl having a phone call with Kranach, because Kranach is a very busy person, and she's asking him what he's doing at the moment, because he was also an entrepreneur, a real estate and he was a pharmacist and he was also a painter. So it's highly interesting to know how he managed to organize his everyday life and that at the same time he was a pharmacist helped him or that he had a pharma pharmacy. A person like him is, is just the entrepreneur of a pharmacy. So it's easy for him to mix colors. So on the right side you can see from a scientific perspective perspective to investigate pigments and you have the researchers glasses what are the colors of such a picture how many layers are there how can I look into such a picture today with infrared refractology that's the magic word for the Krana research so that was something that was to be shown in the pop-up Krana exhibition we have developed this format because pop-up pop pop -up Kranach was very popular and also the BKM we received some awards so we were there was an obligation for us to develop this format further so we had the exhibition called it was the monk and what happened it's about what's happened there 
And what we introduced here was the dog of Luther, Chelpel, who really existed. A dog that, for Luther, it was a very stupid and dumb dog. That's why it was called Chelpel, which is a word for stupid in German. So if he was at the table and gave a sausage or showed a sausage to this dog and this, the dog was was very eager to get the sausage and he says, Luther says, if you were as eager as this dog to get the sausage to get in contact with God, then we would be in a great situation. You can see that Luther didn't stop being a theologian even when he was having a dinner. On the right side, we see how to put your own thesis at the wall. You can use segments of words and put them together and build new words. And there are some proposals for theses that bring us to modern life, modern times. On the left side, how are these theses disseminated, which happened very briefly, very short, in very short time at that time in Germany. So it's a world event from the 31st, 15th and 17th. So if you're working in Wittenberg, then when these theses were put at the bridge, it really happened and it's something that is not to be disputed and that you have to agree to in order to be able to work with Luther. The next exhibition shows, as you see, we are approaching the Bible Jubileum it's called Get Out With Your Language in Eisleben. Eisleben is in the area of Mansfeld, south of Harz, and has the highest rate of an alphabet in Germany. So there's a task also in a completely secular region. How can we, maybe Christians are 6% of both religions, that is. So 95% percent of the population have no space. There's the most post-religious region in this world. Maybe there's a similar region in Czech. So it's a very special uh, ambient where we want to speak about Luther and the input religion has for German culture. It's about dialects. It's about fake news on the right side. It is about non-verbal communication. It's about mimics and gestures. You see a very nice scene here. The minister president is on the one side. And on the other side, we see a very brave uh, girl. And he has to make uh, see uh, show emotions after 10 minutes she says but you look the same all the time but on the other side as he notices that he has a certain face as a politician that he is not capable of expressing anger gratefulness and so it was a great something they both will never forget hopefully also the minister president let's see another view of this exhibition. It is about how language, uh, the effects, how can it affect things. It builds identity, it can hurt, it can exclude people, but if you it can also give you comfort. If you enter this machine, the machine doesn't recognize you, but whatever you do, the machine says something nice to you and you get go out of it and <laughs> You are in a better mood than when, at the time when you walked in. So it's also about the how social media invented new words and have changed our languages, like our language, new expressions. The same as Luther, who created language in certain ways, and who created many German words. So the same applies to the language of today, which is changing again and again and now especially because of social media well for a long time we thought about how we can celebrate the anniversary of the bible in wittenberg in the year 2022 and for a long time that's why it's called just a project 
and a draft that is called Language Laboratory. And we thought of a situation where school classes sit on tables and th they have to fulfill certain tasks. The title was Language Laboratory and in the next room we would have a recording studio where it was also about how many songs are influenced by religion, not only Leonard Cohen's Hallelujah, but how, what influence does the language of the Bible have in modern culture or modern music and song? That's something we wanted to address in this draft. Then it seemed to us it's too close to, to a standard school situation where the pupils had to sit at the tables and it's much better for them to do something and to find, uh, to have results. So, as an So we felt that this would lead us nowhere and thought this cannot be it. And that's how we developed another idea, a completely different format. And it was called Tatwood, that can be translated as crime scene or crime word, 1522. And it's an escape game. Let's go back. So what's the input? of Wittenberg. What's the part of Wittenberg in the translation of the Bible? In the last weeks, and which is legitimate, you heard a lot of Wartburg when it was translated within 11 weeks. This genius sat alone on the Wartburg and translated the Bible and suddenly it, the Lutheran Bible, uh, appeared. That's a myth that is perpetuated. But what was what is the reality if you look at the, the Wittenberg perspective? First of all, it's a completely different person that um, gives the idea for this Bible, who, that, and that is Melanchthon. Luther comes to Wittenberg in December, very secretly, and he writes himself, Melanchthon forced me to translate the Bible. So it's not the idea of Luther, no, it's the idea of the team in Wittenberg. Luther is taking the translation with him and then that's when the real work starts. The team continues working. Melanchthon is responsible for the Greek translation, Orgulus for the Hebrew original. And what's so fascinating about Wittenberg in the Reformation period, that all these talents were here at the same time, in the same place, which in this very small city, that had about 2,500 inhabitants at the time, and only Luther once said, a few kilometers further to the east, and you are uh, in you are nowhere. And that's how Luther sees Wittenberg. And in this little city, all these talents meet. So they become a team somehow, which is responsible for this translation. As you can see, in the second edition, in December 1522, 500 corrections had to be made from between September and December, 500 corrections. So the second edition is already another Luther Bible. And apart from this event or this teamwork, what is important is it is printed here so that the Bible translation is made publicly available and that it is disseminated on the German market so Wittenberg had the monopole to print the Bible, which lasted for 100 years. So it's thanks to the local printing industry, uh, the Bible was disseminated all over Germany, the German Bible. So it's teamwork, the printing, the context of Wittenberg, all this together had to come together and maybe to come to a certain format for education. That's why we tried to use the Luther Bible to shape it in five rooms. And what we want to showcase in these five rooms are the stages of the Luther Bible and how it was developed. This is the kitchen. First of all, what's fascinating about the Luther Bible is that it tries to take the language from the people 
And that's not only program, that's every day. Melanchthon asks botanics for the names of plants. Others are going to the butcher and ask what is the name of that organ, what is the name of that organ. That's why we developed Dorothea's Kitchen. And at the end of the day, that's the origin of the Luther Bible, which is everyday life of the future future potential readers. It has to be translated. That's why we also have created a Melanchthon workshop. It was also designed graphically. That's why the third room is the workshop of Kranach. It has to be printed. That we, that's what we call Lotta's print shop. And it has to be a proof that it can be printed. So Friedrich the Wise and his castle uh, is also represented in another room. So we have five escape rooms altogether. That's how we call them, five, because we want to have school classes between 25 and 30 pupils, children, not only children, also adults, so that we can have five to six persons at the same time in one room and make them play escape rooms. So that's the question if a class comes for one, one and a half hours. That's why we needed this five classrooms. This is a model in which we tried to develop the plot and design it. What should be the, the final question, the important question and the, for which you would receive an award? something you can read in the fly as well. So everybody's waiting for the Luther Bible. It doesn't come. So what's missing? It's the title. Where is it? Is it in the print shop? It's what's missing, the graphic design. Friedrich the Wise opposes to it. Who is the hindrance for printing the Bible? And the task is that in each room, there are five riddles in each room that have to be solved. You get a code to get out of this room and then you need the various codes to go to the detective's wall and put all codes and all information together and combine it to get a final code. And then is where the bad guy comes. The bad guy, I'm not going to tell you about it because you're all invited to experience these escape rooms for yourselves. What does it look like inside? It is like the room of a library, so it's not technical, and that is important for us, that it also has a high quality that you would like, that it feels comfortable, that it has atmosphere, that you would like to stay here. That's why you see two theater painters. They paint the props usually, it's all handwork. Of course, we discussed whether we might just use wallpapers like in the supermarket or in the furniture shop where you want to have walls of books with just a picture. No. Now you enter into a room that seems to be historic. That's why there's handwork. You see here the pictures on the walls. They were made by themselves. On the right side you see the kitchen how it developed over the time. It's also from a handicrafts perspective. It's it's very smart. It's it's a lot of work. It's not cannot be done quickly. It requires also quality, authenticity, at least should create an authentic atmosphere. That's why it was important for us that we work with quality here. So now you see here the kitchen, the final result. This is Dorothea's kitchen, where it is our claim to use everyday experience for translation. And the kitchen, as I said before, it's a sort of a signal that the Luther Bible has an understandability for the source uh, uh, for the reader and the recipients and the we have five riddles here that are hidden and they're quite they're not easy to solve we're talking about historic measures 
and ways how in those times how did they cook at that time so their recipes a, a multitude of riddles you you notice i would still be in there because i would not get out of the kitchen within one hour because i would not be able to find a solution so it's a special perspective or way of thinking but you see later that it is very inviting to deal with history through game and playfulness what you see now is the workshop of Kranach. so it's a quite a nice workshop you see the pictures he is working at at the moment of course he's working for the Ten Commandments because we have this in our museum so he continues his work here and as you can see it's from a haptic it's haptically inviting there were many thoughts put in and how much virtuality do we want to have and we said no we don't want to have any virtuality we thought about that to have digital games printing versus the digital world as a as an experience of distance and to offer this as such but our experience was in the first months it's, it's much more attractive if people can work with their hands do things with their hands to put things next to each other so that's much more inviting than playing digital games computer games so it's an experience of alteration in this setting of an exhibition or game whatever you, however you want to dis which way you want to describe it now you see the castle with historic furniture we had to lend some of them or we just found them but it is our claim that it is supposed to be a nice room even though it's just for playing the question was how 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 quickly is it destroyed so there's if you offer a certain quality people are more aware and people accept it as having this quality if it's done badly people treat it badly and that i think we made quite good experiences with this such a nice room well furnished room here you see one of the riddles you see the print shop on the right side like in a setting case you have to put words together and combine them on the left side you see the translators workshop there are riddles with greek uh, w greek signs and fonts so which is pretty far away actually whether people have an access to this but if you put it in a game then it attracts many people and even to to deal with such a completely foreign uh, language system that you would never mind reading so it's much more about doing things with this is, is much more attractive than just reading it well here we see how it is used it's great it's always loud when they come in it's pre actually pretty loud and and during the as during the presentations the spoken word applies it's not silent silent means reading being loud means understanding and reading something that can be noticed pretty well here as i said to you I said to you the his from historic perspective the luther bible is the product of a team and this team experience is something that was important for us to to uh, to produce and to create in this exhibition it says you have cannot work alone you don't have the fantasy you need a team you have to do it jointly and only this experience how can you tell somebody that you have to do things together is something that uh, was very good in this escape format and mr meyer this various types of symbolization motors of course we did not think about symbolization motors but as you said sensor motoric so the haptic the haptic trial you spoke about the picturesque the 
and uh, observation and language. You have to discuss things. So all these aspects of this symbolization modices are combined here in this joint learning, which is much more a joint game. So we are very happy to welcome school classes, as you can see on the left side. But what is interesting, how do you address or attract people who would just run away if you would speak with them about the Luther Bible. So can we have, for example, advance parties or official parties at the job? And yes, we manage this. And it's not because they th don't think it's just about the Luther Bible. You go to this escape game, but you also learn something about the Luther Bible, something you were never, ever interested in. So if you receive or if you, it's a dialectic uh, trap sort of thing. And here just see a few impressions how vital such a visit to the museum can be suddenly. If it's not just about, you're not a solitaire in front of a display, at the end of the day you are not only at these haptic stations that you, we have quite often, where you, the learning effect and the learning is so clear where it is, where you have to learn something, so you're obliged to learn something. So this school class does not think about learning. They are in a competition against each other. So it's clear if you need more than one hour to get out of the room, then you are the loser. So you have to do it and accomplish this task within one hour. If you are there with five groups in, or if there are five groups in one class, you want to be faster than the other group. So they really put an effort in finding the solution. And as you can see to the right, they also have successes. If these two boys giving high five to each other doesn't happen very often in the museum. This is something this ex to experience success in a team is something that can be uh, achieved with this exhibition format. And as you can see here, you have to find five solutions to get the code of five digits in order to open the door. But this is not the end yet, because it was important for us how do we get these five teams together. So it's not only a competition, but that at the end they see we all have to put all five solutions together so that we have a final joint success. That's why in each room there's a detective uh, suitcase. You have to take it to the detective wall, which can be found at the end of the room. and. Only if you have all solutions and all codes, so it's not just putting in these codes, it's more you have to order them and put them in an order and, and find the solution, it, which is quite a complex task. And then there's, you get the final code and you see on the screen, you see the perpetrator who will explain why he did it. What's interesting, we also have pupils. It's a format you cannot just let go. It's, it, it's quite uh, sophisticated. You need a leader, you need a booking system. And it became clear for us that we cannot do it with our own team. That is why we work together with pupils. Also the riddles were created and developed together with pupils. So we had test groups, seventh grade class, 10th grade class, to see whether it is too difficult or too easy. Is it too far-fetched or because also each in each room you, it was important that it would take the same time to find the solutions. And we found pupils as being the 
referees here, also adults, so we have 16, 17 years old, year olds can be ruthless. Last week there was a group of teachers <laughs> and they couldn't get out of their room <laughs> because what children uh, achieve in 20, 30 minu minutes was impossible for teachers and then one teacher had to go to the teeny referee, can you not tell us what it is and try to uh, try to bribe him but he found it very hard referee and Jacob was his name no just said no you can say inside to the teachers well what you can see at the end you can look at this as well that this is after the escape game we have one more room because we are a bit of a museum and we have the feeling if the people think oh it's just a game no of course it was debated is it is it still does it still have the claim to be educational so we have another information room where you can see these are the word creations of luther so an information room where we thought maybe the teacher or the parents can make clear that they know more than students or pupils so we also need an adult level in the museum so that especially the fathers can show that they know more and have a greater knowledge to prove and stage their authority and with with facts and information here we have therefore this huge lexicon where you can turn the pages but i must say the escape game is what is extremely attractive and the concentrations is still there at the end but not as big as it was during the escape game and here this last picture we have five instagram boxes for each room so instagramability is the key word here and pupils it was a arts class so they use these, no, these boxes, use the topics and the subjects of these five escape rooms and invite the group to take pictures with the hashtag, yes, we were here. And for us, it's an implicit advertisement that it was fun and enjoyable. This is one attempt to, to use game to implement the cerebral very complicated topic and we heard that language creates a joint practice and togetherness and that's why this format implements exactly this thank you very much for your attention Oh, thank you very much, Mr. Ryan. This is really lively and encouraging to see that language can be very much alive. And I've, I'm here with my laptop because I've got the images that Dr. Schöne wanted to show Just a second, I will try to connect my computer. Sorry, I, I'd rather not try on my own. But Dr. Schöne, please come up on stage to the mic and start with an introduction of what you want to share with us. <coughs> Sorry, I'm not prepared, so I can't really introduce her, but this is her. All right, thank you very much for spontaneously allowing me to uh, take up some time here to share 10 pictures. My name is Anja Schöne. Since 2016, I've been the director of the Lidio Museum, uh, the Museum for Religious Culture, in the pilgrimage 
village of Telchte in Münsterland. And I'm a cultural scholar, not a theologian. But here you can see the museum. We have two buildings, one modern building. Josef Paul Klei is a famous architect who commissioned this and worked on it. And all of this I'm showing here is part of the museum as well. And here in the foreground you can see the pilgrimage chapel in Telchte. Most of you cer certainly know there's a Pietai that is um, honored and you can walk on foot from Osnabrück to Telchte and it's the longest foot pilgrimage in Germany. And we had this exhibition of Egghurt Sumir. He is part of me. Um, it's not only about Muslim people in Telchte, there's not a many, but in Germany. And Ulfhard, Miss Ulfhard already mentioned it and said something about this exhibition because she's in the scientific advisory board of this exhibition. And we also have hired staff, which is a theologian for Islam studies and an ethnologist. And they worked on the concept of this exhibition. So this was the beginning of the exhibition, or this is where you start. We have 12 people from all over Germany. On the one hand, they have different backgrounds of migration coming from different regi regions, Turkey, Bosnia. One woman has Togolese background from Northern Africa. And we just wanted to show the diversity of the Muslim community in Germany. We did interviews with these people and we think it's important to talk about the target group of this exhibition because we thought this exhibition is for non-Muslims who want to learn about Muslims and the Islam. And maybe you'll see in the middle here, we see the five pillars of Islam. And these 12 people talked about how they live their religious practice in Germany. Thus, ex and explaining Islam, their religion at the same time. We worked really hard on, or we used staging a lot. You can see these two people who can speak about mosque and prayer. And you can, you see the media station, you can just sit down in the back. You can see a kind of mosque room that we staged. We had two pairs of shoes. And if visitors wanted to do it, they could um, do, they could pray and learn how to pray as a man or a woman in Islam, try it out and um, learn how to kneel down, what that feels like, it's different positions. A few people did it, but not many, rather school classes where we had Muslim students as well who showed their fellow students how to pray. Now we have this info panel here that you can open on how building mosques and the prayer calls. I think it's a very important topic since yesterday. I think there's a prayer call, a public one in Cologne and maybe you've already seen that we tried to use positive colors and these info panels that are not orientalist but uh, lend a modern touch to the topic. So we have this very colorful pictorial language. When you look at the media we often have titles like the dark side of Islam and uh, women who wear the hijab or other um, head coverings and we wanted to show something else and wanted to have a different attitude but of course there are critical aspects 
and we want, didn't want to ignore them, we didn't want anyone to say, well, it's just a soft version, which is why we had some more info panels that you could open up, um, the debate of mosque and mosque construction and callings for or the calls for prayers. Is it really a good debate or proxy debates? And we had a critical debate about this, about circumcision and about head coverings as well, the scarf. Uh, this is another look at the room where it's about Hajj and the sacrificial, the Feast of Sacrifice. We have Ramadan and breaking fast. And we have these opportunities to get information and this is just for you to get an insight into the exhibition and the pictorial language that we used, the visual language. So we had two target groups, one I already mentioned, the non-Muslim people who wanted to learn about Islam, which is why it was necessary to have quite a lot of texts about the even beyond the media stations and what you see behind this black pillar is a timeline that shows the um, interdependence well of orient and occident we shouldn't say it like that but east east and west kind of um, and we didn't want to focus only on the Turkish wars, but the cultural exchange and the scientific exchange. So we try to come up with a timeline that is more that opposes the current trend and uh, prejudices and ideas that circulate. And this timeline started in seventh century and ends well in the twenty first century. And our second target group, sorry, I can't forget about them, were Muslim visitors. They actually did come in, I'd say of the tot total of 4,000 visitors, maybe 10% were Muslim. And you have to remember Telchte in Münsterland is more rural and there's not such an interreligious um, context. So I think 10% was pretty good. And most important to us was, well, we had students as well, student groups from Münster. And the main question was always, do you see yourself represented in this exhibition? And most of them said yes, very clearly, and they posted on social media and said, come on, look at this exhibition. Finally, we are in a museum and they're not speaking about us, but, but with us. And I think that was a very important sign. Then we had these um, religious practices. We had one room about circumcision and the giving of name. We had this person uh, providing information. Then marriage funerals, then we have another guest worker here, and after 40 years of life in Germany, he will get his funeral here. Oh, we had another info panel on funeral without a coffin. Then we had another room from the exhibits because with the exhibits because in our museum and other museums we've found a lot of amulets and talismans and this was very popular among Muslim theolo theologians because in Islam officially these things did not exist and now suddenly we have all of these amulets and talismans here. Quran, jewelry, pendants, um, and this is a very important aspect 
the Scientific Advisory Council said or pointed out, of course, it's legitimate to have the focus on religion in a religious museum or in a religion museum. But this is a prejudice that Muslim people are much more religious than Christians. They don't primarily identify themselves with their religion. So all of these um, participants, the interviewees, we asked them to find an object which stands for their life, for their non-religious life. And uh, at the top left, we see a teacher's bag from a young teacher. Bottom left, we have a helmet from a man who worked in mining. And a theologian from Berlin brought gloves and gardening tools and said, well, in his free time, he gardens. And that's something very important to him. And you can see through this door at the very end, all of our interviewees were asked, A, what do you wish for, for future coexistence in the German society? Or if it was too abstract, what do you wish for, for the exhibition? And then we had this large screen and had some statements by all 12 interviewees. And at the end of the day, that was the end of the exhibition. So I think this fits in quite well with what we discussed today. And it has something to do with design of an exhibition, with pictorial language, visual language, what you can transmit, not, and it goes, um, it's about the languages of the objects and beyond. So thank you very much. And maybe, well, we have a catalog at the back, or you can just get the leaflet, which has many more aspects. Thank you. Well then, thanks. Thank you very much that we have this practical round here at the end of this conference. I would like to no, just I have three quotes here from the speeches given of Mr. Dinkelacker. It's quite a long quote that are which is not really a quote from his presentation God no humans do not live from of bread alone but also of that bread that stems from the mouth of God and I wanted to juxtapose here a quote from your presentation a mitigation of the dramatic of violence a very strong sentence and that Mr. Ryan was a sentence the doing with the foreign that's something you put in relation with the handling that the visitors of the exhibition should show and the, the behavior they should use to deal with language what wasn't clear for me Mr. Ryan is where was language here Bible was supposed to be the media of language, but how did the visitors uh, see language? How was language showcased? Well, our introduction was that to showcase the translation of the Bible and not to start with the finalized Bible, but from the development of the Bible to find out how does this text uh, how is it developed, how is it created, how is it generated, how is it printed. It has to be approved for printing. That's why we have these five rooms that show the five aspects and factors for the development of the Luther Bible. Language 
is there in the various rooms. For example, in the translator workshop, it's very intensive. You have to put letters together and find words and have to use Greek letters that correlate with Latin letters. So your question is justified. The Luther Bible is the event and our attempt was to document its creation, but language also exists because we it was clear for us that you can only solve these riddles if you speak with each other, if you use language. Of course, we have quotes of Luther, they are very impressive. And I don't love them, but I what I love much more is young people discuss with each other how they can solve this problem and they want to find out how can I find a solution. How does Kranach do that, for example, in the design workshop? So it's an exhibition as, an, as a language event. It's a language event of the Bible and it's to experience this language event by, its, by speaking for oneself. These are the two levels that we want to, to combine. And something that could be seen very clearly in your presentation where you spoke about word and object, how they can the the more silent this relation is, the more burning is the uh, knowledge. And what you experience of if the Bi the world of the Bible in your own discovery process and to experience this for oneself makes it much more sustainable also uh, when you memorize this. Miss Bloom, yes, thank you. Well, yes, the quest, my question is, because at the beginning you spoke, you do this with school classes, pupils, do they, have they noticed the mitig mitigation of violence or is it the, how hard these arrows were put in the body? No, they're exactly interesting. This children and teenies are interested in violence and especially especially the, these depictions where the parents say, oh my God, please don't let our children see this. Um, the adults say this is violence which shouldn't exist, shouldn't be presented, especially not for small children. Whereas on the other side, we have children and they are very interested in this. And if you let them enter the picture level, then you reach the attempt, which is promises to be successful, um, to speak with children about violence. What does it mean? What is a cross? And it's much more successful than with, with adults. So it's no problem to speak with them because they're highly interested in this. And even juveniles, if they enter such a context, are even more interested in weapons than in Maria Magdalena, whatever we have in depictions of holy persons, but could they understand that violence as violence as such is something that was not meant here? The aspect of mitigation is this transferable? No, this is not what it is about. I'm speaking about the meanings and the sense of violence and why it is depicted in such a way to get onto a level of sense and existence, how it is represented and depicted. I, I'm trying to show them what is depicted and that violence is not depicted and why it is not depicted. Because on the first view, our eyes see there's blood. The second view is that this blood is not in the focus of the picture. So these interpretation levels is something I want to reach with pupils and put this in relation with the existential questions of being a human. Thank you very much. May I open the round? Uh, Mr. Dinkelacker, thanks for joining us again. My question to you is not very well formulated here. The thing about bread and the gender relation is still quite an open issue, isn't it? I have to admit that I have difficulties understanding you from because the sound isn't good enough. Well, I was the word that's coming out from the 
mouth of God and is becoming bread. So I, getting started here, I wanted to tie this to the definition of gender, where this godness comes from the religious language. Uh, can, how can it be clarif clarified? Well, yes, this is always one of the questions. For example, in Judaism and Islam, it is quite clear. And you will also be in the catalogue in the article of Jeshua Arendt and a Jewish theologian and an Islamic theologian to speak about the gender of God is something that is not really, doesn't make any sense interreligiously. God doesn't have a, a sex or gender and so on. But what's impressive is that Bible um, also speaks about this topic and that God, the being of God is real, can be defined as male or female. Why, why that's the reason? There's a relation here that we see, but the big question is why it is, uh, why it is like that, and but it is like that, and that God creates and gives birth, and we speak of God as a father, at least in the Christian tradition, and there are what is left in, in the space is whether this is a real fatherhood. Maybe it's just adopted. It's an adaptation of a son. And we wanted to use this, this knowledge that we all are aware of the pictures of God and the depictions of God and whether this has to be male or female. It was very interesting to discuss this and we'll, we have received a lot of objections. But at the end, it's always, and that's something we tried with this wall picture. If you speak about God, then you also speak about humans. And there are such cracks where the light shines through that we can also speak about humans in their diversity and that we see this already in the Bible. Thank you very much, Mr. Dinkalako. Any questions from the audience? We're all a bit exhausted today, I think. So, let's not overstretch this. Thank you very much for your participation here. Then I would like to ask Mr. Ryan to give us the final keynote here and to say the goodbye from Wittenberg here today. Right. I don't think there will be any yield from me coming, as uh, Stefan put it. Just take home the associations you had during these two days, because everyone has experienced a different conference from the point of view of uh, the aesthetics of reception. That's just normal. So we started talking about the September Testament and me as someone from Wittenberg, uh, I'd like to go back to that and it was all about clarity and understandability it's luther's movements for translation but the ambition to let the religious text interpret itself that seems to be utopian because otherwise our conference wouldn't exist if text is self is understandable on its own then we don't have we don't need hermeneutics and we don't need this conference that tries to examine different forms of religious speech there are very different formats of translation about religious and secular uh, aspects and we were talking about translation and what i found very interesting is that we've always come back to poetry and art as if they were the two central modes that people with poetry, art, contemporary art, um, they use that to approach religion. And apparently poetry and art open up spaces for differences. 
technical language wants to define, but poetry and art open up spaces for differences and resist totalitarian determinations. So these two forms of language have been evoked again and again here. And with a philosophical speech is an added form, we can think about that, I think. And how can we foster exchange between secular and religious speech? How can we organize that? How can we translate religious speech into secular speech? And maybe philosophical speech is a third option, especially when philosophical speech is it defined so openly like with as with Socrates and Plato. So meiotics, like in Plato's case, are so open and they can tolerate differences. What I found very interesting was what's the application to museums? We as curators are always emphasizing ourselves, and but we always want to inform but we've seen that this is authoritarian, nearly totalitarian speech, which is not appropriate for religion. So we need to examine ourselves and our own activities. When you, you hand over this monopoly of interpretation, and of course we had theoretical contemplations and reflections, uh, but they apply to the museal practice because put it to put it very strongly, curatorial texts kill artifacts. They take away their life and we want it's this is a a plea against the dominance of the definitions and Museums have to issue an invitation, an open invitation for making your own experience. It's about communication and invitations for existential speech, because at the end of such an act of speaking, of education, we need mehr res agitur or tua res agitur. It's not about religion, it's about you as a religious object. And this is the task, re-semanticizing curatorial work when it is about religion. So we have uh, a lot left to do, all of you who are helping us, us from the museums, and evidently we need to redefine our profile in such a way that we don't want to know everything, but just invite to ask questions. And this is the task that we need to face. So, Harald Twilley has already um, mentioned it. This series of conferences will never stop because otherwise it would be authoritarian and totalitarian. So it needs to remain open in order to fulfill its task appropriately. Thank you very much and get home safely. Thank you. <coughs> So we have the German Ertrag yield, which is linked to the verb Ertragen, to bear something. Well, I hope it was more than bearable. I have taken a lot of things home, or will take a lot of things home with me, many new perspectives, and I love this combination of practical questions of how do I implement this in the museum. and like bearing this void or this gap that religion can only circumvent. And you just said it, we want to reach as many people as possible with this. That's how I would put it, without being authoritarian and totalitarian. So I really agree with you. We don't need this Vermittlungsdepartment for explaining everything. We just need education. And religion can really contribute to museums and exhibitions. And religious speech, as my 
um, father-in-law would say it, the most important thing about a hole is its uh, corners. And thank you very much about for coming here. Thank you very much to everyone who participated online on YouTube. Thank you for contributing to the discussions. Thank you for the conversations and the breaks and over lunch. Uh, thank you to everyone who has co-founded us, our co-organizers. And also thank you, Stefan Bayer already named uh, them yesterday, to all of the crew who made sure everything works out. The tech staff, our interpreters, I did listen in. Thank you so much. And of course, my staff as well that have helped out in the background. We'll, we'll celebrate this later. So thank you so much. See you again. Come again to the next conference. Get home safely. Thank you.